we've done ourselves a disservice by fleeing media, by moving away from entertainment, yeah. by being afraid of these things. You know, or even worse, are you you been keeping up with all this uh, hoopla around? Uh, the sound of freedom yeah. and some yeah. of the backlash about the sound yeah. of freedom. Anytime someone or something works mm -hmm. outside of the system, mm. I think people are. Bruce Lawn. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is going to be a conversation. You, you're going to need to watch the full thing wherever you're watching or listening to this on what, whatever platform because we have an incredible guest all right this brother went from being a nigerian prince to a navy seal to a actor director in hollywood slash author there's a movie that is going to be made about his life without any further ado yeah. remy Adeleke. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What's up, brother? Man, Thanks thank you so on. much for being on. Yeah. We get the mic just a tad bit closer yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. We usually put uh, people's mics up louder than mine. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, but yeah. you're 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 good now. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, man, bro, yeah. your life story yeah. is insane. Yeah, it's been crazy. <laughs> uh, you got two books uh, well, out. Yeah. By the time this comes out, there'll be the yeah. new book out, which yeah. is called Chameleon. Black uh, box thriller. Chameleon black black box thriller. And then you, obviously you got your memoir. Yeah. Uh, there's so many things I want to talk to you about. Yeah. Let's just start at the beginning for folks who have never heard of you. A yeah. little bit about your background, and yeah. we'll get into the Navy SEAL yeah. journey, and then obviously the new stuff with yeah. being an author and and, and Hollywood yeah. and acting and directing yeah. uh, and some of your testimony. So for folks who have never heard of Remy, yeah. uh, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I was uh, my story actually starts with my dad's story. Um, he was the firstborn son to my grandfather. My grandfather had like eight or nine wives. Um, this was normal in uh, Nigerian culture, uh, especially in the, in the tribal system. But also my grandfather was Muslim as well. Mm. And uh, uh, and he kept on having daughters with these nine wives. And then finally my grandmother produced my grand my father, uh, who was a firstborn son. Uh, and um, in Nigeria, we refer to royalty as king. Sorry, in the West, we refer to royalty as king, queen, prince, princess, Dutch, that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. in African culture, especially West African culture, royalty is referred to as chief. So mm. my grandfather was a chief, and because my dad was a firstborn son, he became a chief and then inherited the last name, naturally, Adeleke, which Ade means crown, and Leke means is supreme or is above. Mm. And so um, um, my dad, that's what my dad was born into. My grandfather died when my dad was eight. Mm. The wives kind of dispersed to different parts of Nigeria. Mm. Uh, my dad went down to the south uh, near Lagos where my grandmother brought him. And at the time, they were Christian missionaries. Mm. And not only were they teaching the Bible, but they were also teaching math, science, literature, you know, all Western topics that we learn in school. And my dad was brilliant. Um, mm. He actually had memorized the Quran by the time he was like six years old, mm -hmm. six or seven years old. So... Um, when the missionaries came along, he was able to, mem he memorized the Bible quick. Mm. Like he was able to memorize mathematical equations and the missionaries like, man, you're a savant. So mm. they ended up play playing a role in him. By the time he got to high, got done with high school, they played a role in him getting a full ride academic scholarship to uh, London. Mm. And he ended up uh, studying architecture, engineer, full ride scholarship, um, got his bachelor's and master's in both architecture, engineering. And then he started accumulating his, his wealth and starting his businesses in the West and the UK. Mm. And in the U.S., as a matter of fact, he was the first uh, or the first black man on the border to a World Trade Center in New York City. Well, uh, he was one of the first black men on the, on the British Financial Planning Council in Great Britain. And he just had all of these relationships, all of these connections. And he was just super successful because of his brilliance. Yeah. Fast forward uh, to the. So, so, so on, a quick question for yeah. you. So you said your dad's family dispersed because yeah. there was you said how many wives? There were like eight nine wives. Eight nine yeah. wives. Now did they did you ever did you guys ever reconnect with any of the other family? Your brother ever connect with some of his other uh, I guess half brothers, um, half sisters? Anything my, like that? My dad. Well, I, I I can't really. I was. I'm just. I was. I'm so far removed from that because mm -hmm. I mean we're talking like. 40s 50s 60s you yeah. know what i mean and uh so i can't really and i was so small yeah you know i don't know we'll get to it later but i was so small that my when my dad died yeah. and we came to the states that i never really connected with those with the other family members got it for the okay. most part so you didn't grow up uh seeing 
your grandfather's multiple wives or, no. or, or having any exposure no. to that. No. But no. it was fairly, fairly common in that part of the world. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. 100% common. I mean, going back to biblical time, yeah. David had all it, that, yeah. you know, more than midwives it's, and all it's that. It's a trip yeah. because it's interesting yeah. that there's a, there's, there's a, a resurgence of this sort yeah. of uh, polyamory, yeah. polygamy yeah. Um, narrative now. Yeah. And so I'm always curious of people mm -hmm. that were closer to it, yeah, yeah. how do they view it, it, it as, as kind of being semi-connected to it? Clearly, again, you yeah, aren't yeah. super connected to it, but yeah, yeah. I'm always curious about folks who grew up in it and yeah. what do they think about yeah, it? Yeah, I was too far removed from it yeah. um, um, because because my grandfather had died like years earlier and mm. well, decades earlier and, uh, and my dad didn't expose me to it. As a matter of fact, you know, when my before my dad my dad had become more westernized i would mm -hmm. say um uh, when he came you know went to college in the west and got his education and started his businesses so i think that was kind of worked out of him gotcha. you know by the time he came back to nigeria mm -hmm. um so in the 70s he actually went back to nigeria because he wanted to take all of his wealth and everything he learned mm -hmm. to create like a nigerian wall street or like wow. a world trade center in nigeria wow uh because nigeria is very rich in resources cocoa oil yeah. natural gas gold minerals yeah. even yeah. now china is going to yeah. nigeria and other parts of uh of africa and signing these deals to buy this land so they can mine for the resources right do you feel like that's yeah. that's kind of colonization all over again somewhat I Somewhere, mean, it sounds yeah, super yeah, sus, yeah, man, yeah, where they're yeah. giving out these loans, yep. but they can control the roads, yep. Yep. and they're building this big system yep. across. It. it sounds super, yeah. super sus, yeah. man. They're trying to build, from what I can't remember the exact name, but they're essentially trying to build a trail, like an invisible, I don't know, this might be sound stupid, but somewhat of an invisible trail or path from not just from Africa, but from other parts of Europe mm -hmm. that's going to center into the heart of China mm -hmm. so that, you know, they could essentially control a lot of the resources yeah, yeah. and uh and and they they're playing on the corruption in a lot of these african countries nigeria mm. being a very corrupt nation mm. because they're finding these politicians or governors and they're like oh i'll give you i'll give you 50 million for this you know be able to access this when in reality that that mine or that oil reserve is worth a hundred billion, you know what I mean? Mm. I, they're throwing out a random sure, number, sure, sure. and a politician's like, "Yeah, hey, I'll, I'll take the fifty million." Wow. You know what I mean? So it's a lot of that going on as well. Mm. And you know, because of all of the resources in Nigeria, my dad, that's why my dad wanted to create this Wall Street, this World Trade Center, yeah. so that Nigeria could be more organized from a business standpoint gotcha. and would, can be respected. Because if those resources were handled properly. There's no reason why Nigeria could be like the like America yeah, or yeah. Saudi Arabia, yeah. which is a very rich country yeah. because of their oil and resources. Do you think the lack of it, quote unquote, being handled properly mm -hmm. is because of uh, imperialism, colonialism? No, it, I, I mean, I, 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 I personally, my opinion, no. Okay. I think that it has to do with an inherent corruption that's been a part of the nation for decades. Mm. Uh, you know, because colonialism in Africa went away how many how long ago I don't yeah. want don't quote me on the yeah, number but decades well, hundreds ago. of years ago yeah. uh, in some parts yeah. Man, yeah and so now you have you have people for the last 20 30 years even we'll get to what happened to my dad mm -hmm. who have been you know politicians who have been stealing money and stealing resources mm. can't blame that mm -hmm. on colonialism sure. you can't blame a, a governor as a matter of fact here in the U.S. in the inner city, mm -hmm. you know, I know speaking for myself, when people try to rise up through the ranks, right? Um, what do they look to? They oh, let me play basketball, let me rap, sure. let me you know, let me you know, hustle because yeah. that's how I can I could rise up. Mm -hmm. In Nigeria, the kids are taught from a very young age going to politics. Really? Oh, going to become a pop, become a governor, become a mayor, become a senator, going to politics because that's your way of becoming a multimillionaire or billionaire. Sheesh. It's so systemic and it's 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 wide wow. press and known. There's a saying in Nigeria every day is for the thief. That's mm -hmm. like a well known saying. There's a bunch of other sayings like if you fight corruption, it'll fight you back. Mm. All of these sayings come out of Nigeria because it's very prevalent and widespread. So, uh, yeah, in my opinion, that can't be blamed on colonialism that happened decades ago. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we have to, as people, we have to take responsibility for our actions. Ten, you know, whether it was ten years ago, whether it was you know a person ten years ago, or a person five years ago, or a person today, we all have to take responsibility for our actions and say, ah, yeah. oh, it's not this person's fault. Mm -hmm. Or excuse me. 
colonialism's fault. It's my fault. I'm the one that's stealing the money from my own people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Dang. And so that's my two yeah. cents on that. But yeah, that's um, good. Um, but yeah, my dad went back and he started this and he bought a massive plot of land in um, uh, uh, Lagos area called Marico. Uh, he spent seven million uh seven or eight million pounds on it at okay. the time okay. um and this is in the 70s and a military coup happened shortly after and so that that land was taken from him and uh you know they just they just took it from they him just took it so he buys the, so he, he buy, yeah. so your dad is a savant he's yeah. brilliant mm -hmm. he has he, he he's a, a christian at this point yeah yeah he took on yeah. the name he took on the name john okay as a way to Pay, uh, pay homage to the the missionary. So yeah, yeah, he, got you. I want to say he's like a born again Christian, but he had like the Christian attributes, if that makes got sense. You know, entitled just like America, a lot of Americans it, it, influenced yeah. probably by a Christian worldview yeah. from the missionaries yeah. Yeah. that that helped you know get yeah. him uh, educated and all that kind yeah. of stuff, memorizing yeah. the Bible. Yeah, and so then he goes over to Europe, goes over to America, yeah, uh, becomes successful, yeah. comes back yeah. to help. Yeah. Buys this land, yep. and then uh, a coup happens. A military coup, yep. And they just take it from him. And they just take it, yeah. Because the government, the, the military's like, oh, this is ours. Or this, I mean, it, would, it wasn't just my dad. There was a lot of other people's land and properties and and businesses that That's were taken crazy. in the coup as well. Um, so after democracy was reinstalled, mm -hmm. a f you know, a few years after the coup, um, my dad went to court, fought the Nigerian government in court. The federal government um, essentially said, all right, we won't give you back Marico because now it's been taken over by somebody else at this point. Mm -hmm. What do you want for compensation? And so there was a swamp in uh, uh, Lagos, Koei specific, which is a part of Lagos. And uh, uh, my dad was like, I want the swamp, which it was a swamp slash lagoon. Mm -hmm. He was like, what are you going to do with the swamp? What can you do with that? He's like, don't worry about it. Just give me that. Mm. And uh, the reason why he wanted the swamp, the lagoon, was because he was going to do what was done at, in, in London with the Heathrow Airport where he wanted to dredge the foreshore to essentially create a man-made island. Mm. Because in his mind, him being so forward-thinking, if I create something where there was never something, no coup, nobody could ever come along and say, that belongs to me or I'm taking it back. Oh, because he's, he's legit. He's, I mean, that's yeah. that's the next level. Yeah. So he's literally yeah. trying to build something yeah. inside of a land that's kind of uninhabitable. And not even land, water. Wow. He's trying to build something on water in order to be able to avoid somebody coming along and saying, hey, this belongs to me. I am taking this. Yeah, yeah. You know, because he was well aware of the corruption. And just like we have we have rights laws here. Mm -hmm. You know, you bought this house or you buy a studio or whatever. Sure. Like, the government won't come in and mm -hmm. say, oh, that belongs to us because of our rights laws. But mm -hmm. it doesn't exist like that, not just in Nigeria, but in other parts of the world. Yeah. You know, that's the good thing about living here in America. Yeah. Like yeah. we can buy something as long as we're paying our mortgage. Yep. Ain't no government ain't gonna come in and right. take it away from us, right. you know? And so um, that was his mindset. And uh, and so he hired Dutch engineers from the Nether uh, engineers from the Netherlands um, to dredge the foreshore, spent millions more dollars and essentially he created one of the first man-made islands in Africa. Whoa. Um, and, and he named it Lagoon City. Um, he signed uh, contracts with Marks and Spence, which was like a shopping uh, mall type back in the day, uh -huh. McDonald's, other companies to be able to, you know, have their businesses on the island to service the, the, the workers and to service the businesses. Because again, this wasn't meant to be a residential island. This mm -hmm. was meant to be a business sector. Mm -hmm. um, the Twin Towers, he had the same guy, the Japanese guy, who was the architect of the Twin Towers mm -hmm. in New York City, that same guy uh, created the uh, blueprints for the Twin Towers that were going to stand at the center of Lagoon City. Wow. Um, and this is all... And like, this is after zone. losing it all and, 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 and getting it back. Yeah, yeah. Dang. Yeah. And so my, that's kind of when I came along. So okay. I was born in 82. My brother was born in 81. So okay. when I was born, I was born into the wealth. Mm -hmm. You know, we had nannies and cars and drivers and we traveled the world. You know, we ate, my dad would host these lavish parties in our, on our compound mm -hmm. slash mansion mm -hmm. with dignitaries, the expats and all of these very influential people, not just from Nigeria, but from America as well. And um and that was the life I went to. I went to a, a very prestigious private school in Nigeria, and uh, uh, we didn't want for anything. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom was American, uh, is American, um, still alive. 
and uh, you know, her and my dad met in in at the Metropolitan Museum of Natural History because my dad was always fascinated. I mean, my dad loved artists and was an art collector yeah. as well. My mom That's a fly museum, by yeah, the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's an awesome museum. And my mom, um, you know, she always loved African art and it happened to be an exhibit on Yoruba art, which we're Yoruba from the Yoruba tribe. Mm -hmm. And so my mom went and my dad happened to be in New York for business. He went, they met, got married five mm -hmm. months later, and then my mom moved to Nigeria with him. Mm. And so um, when I came along again, I was born into this lavish life. But fast forward, uh, the Lago state government in 87, the Lago state government came in and said the federal government, but they conveniently waited until the land had formed mm. and until construction on buildings started to come in and say the federal government was never supposed to award you the swamp. Uh, and so it belongs to us. Gosh, this, man. This is corruption. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, and so they essentially took it from him. And my dad went to court to fight them again because he had to, my, he had leveraged all, not just his money. I mean, he put up, like, his art, everything. So mm -hmm. much so that my mom would tell my dad all the time. They didn't argue much, but the only time that they did, when they did argue, the argument was always about you need to put money in the U.S. Mm. Because I don't trust the systems, what my mom was saying. And if, if we, if the Nigerian come, government comes in and does what they did to you last time, mm. we're going to be penniless. And my mm. dad would just say, that's not going to happen. No worry. My priority is my people, my country. Once I get this island developed and start renting out spaces and get the twin towers built and all of this we will put all the millions of dollars you want to put in the u.s but not until mm. and not until everything is done because he was loyal to his people mm. which a lot of nigerians with that type of power and prestige are not mm. right it's all about self and uh and so um yeah man he uh you know they took it from him he went to court to fight him and he mysteriously died three weeks later Jeez. and when that happened we were from rich to poor wow. um and we, we lost everything yeah and my mom being an american was just like there's no way i'm raising my kids here in nigeria yeah, yeah. and so she brought us back to the states wow and i, I grew up in the bronx so that's kind of how the whole africa Ooh. stuff happened. Yeah, okay yeah. so yeah. how long that you said your dad they, they they take the city the 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 lagoon city is it still there it's still there it's, yeah if you google, google banana island let me Google it's, it. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, they renamed it Banana Island, uh, and the nickname for it now in Nigeria is Billionaire's Island. Um, so essentially, uh, that's it. So they turned it into a, uh, a residential island. So some of the richest, that's, that's the island my dad made. So some of the richest uh, Africans. What a trip, man. Yeah. The richest Africans in the world have compounds in the states on Banana Island. But initially, it was it was a commercial sector, though, right? It was supposed to be a bit, yeah. It's supposed to be like a, a you know his designs, which if uh, they, there's, there's an article up there or a uh, link up there somewhere. I think it might be on the Wikipedia or something like that. Uh -huh. uh, if you type all, it show, show up. But you know his uh, designs were the blueprint for it, uh, and it was supposed to be not a residential area, but um, Mixed use, maybe, maybe that one's it. It was supposed to be like a like a you know commercial sector. Got you. So, wow, so yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, but that's what so, they turned so, into. Yeah. So he loses. <sighs> yep. He lo he he loses that, and then he tries to fight him again. And he tries to fight him again, and, and that's uh, when that's when he dies three weeks in the, later in the middle of the court case. Yep. In the middle of in the middle of <sighs> battling with them, and the autopsy was he got there's a lot more to the story, but he ended up getting bit by a dog. He was super stressed out, going for a walk. A neighbor's dog bit him. He went to the hospital, um, got medication, you know, just as a, you know, a precaution in case, you know, the dog had rabies or whatever the case may be, and took the medication. Well, he he flew to Germany for some business, flew to New York for some business, came back to Nigeria, and that's when he took the medication, and that's what killed him. Um, wow, dude. And, and they, they, they found they, they, an autopsy. It was like it was, I mean, bad medication, but essentially it was poison. Oh, and uh, and the Nigerian government, they knew my dad was a very powerful man because he had a lot of relationships. He was connected to the Alu Alu. Uh -huh. uh, I know I'm pronouncing it wrong, but the Alu 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 is considered like the king of the Yorubas. Okay. So he had relationship a relationship with him. He had he was connected to top generals in the government, politicians, everybody, and they all knew that this man will fight to the death. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a very vociferous, very smart man, and they and and you know. 
honestly, some of the, a lot of the people in his inner circles don't want to dent him dirty. As a matter of fact, our family security guard, which was my dad's personal security guard, mm-hmm. to this day is the manager of Banana Island. No. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, so uh, and there, there's a there's a general, I won't mention his name, who um, has a property on the island, and he was supposed to be my dad's best friend. So there were a lot of things that Gosh, were, were, you know, corrupt about the whole situation. Sheesh. Yeah, man. Do you think yeah. your dad would have won that lawsuit? If, if oh, 100%. Yeah. Oh, 100%. I mean, because he's, he was a very, not only was he a visionary, but he was a very driven man. Mm-hmm. And I and I, and I think that like I know for a fact that that's why I am the way I am now, and that's why I've been able to accomplish the things that I've accomplished is because I had that same driven DNA code in my yeah. system. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And it gets me in trouble sometimes because yep. I am so like, yo, let's get this done. Let's, and and yeah, he would. I mean, as a matter of fact, you know, my half brother, my dad was married years before he married my mom, and um, he got divorced. But his uh, his uh, my half brother has been fighting the court since 87 because he's a lawyer and uh they offered him like six years ago five six years ago they offered him eight million dollars mm. and my brother turned it down because you know again my dad spent eight million pounds yeah which adjusts for inflation you know what i mean yeah, and then yeah. pounds is you know you know one pound is like three dollars something mm-hmm. like that here in the u.s but then on top of that interest but then on mm-hmm. top of that all the other money my dad spent to develop the island sure. it's worth billions of dollars now it's worth billions wow. of dollars if we if he wins the case i'll be a billionaire wow. <laughs> you know what i mean but i remember as a kid you know i would always ask my mom are we gonna ever get she's like no don't hold your breath not uh, dealing in the nigerian court system <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? so how old are you when your dad passes right? i was five you were five yeah wow. i was five so this is and then yeah. other siblings that with your mom yeah my brother so my brother he was six he was a year older than mm. me. yeah yeah and so your mom's like we're coming back to america yeah, we're coming back to america yeah and you guys moved to the bronx, the bronx in yeah. the late 80s late 80s crack epidemic um Mafia. I remember going to the corner store and seeing the mafia guys with the big collars going in and shaking down the owners for their taxes. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, you know, drug dealers. Every it was, it was, it was crazy, man. Mm-hmm. Hip hop and its peak. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Late eighties mm-hmm. and, and its inception, early nineties. So yeah, man. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So pretty, 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 pretty huge contrast. You being yeah. five, six years old, super yeah. wealthy, and now you're in the Bronx. What was that yeah. like? You know, I, I tell people all the time, my mom, she did a really good job of masking the reality of what had happened, mm. you know, um, and I, you, I, case in point, I remember the moment she told us our father died. Mm-hmm. Um, she sat me down uh, on her right side, my brother on her left side on this red couch and uh, not couch, but it's like a chair couch. Mm-hmm. And she said, hey, your father has died and he's not coming back. And she said it to us in such a calming, calm way. Mm-hmm. My brother and I just looked at each other because my dad traveled a lot anyway. And he was mm-hmm. just like, okay. And plus, we didn't know what death meant. And we mm-hmm. just went back to playing. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, talking to my mom about that um, years later, you know, she told me I had to keep it together because mm-hmm. I knew that if I didn't keep it together and, you know, put on this, you know, positive front, mm-hmm. then you would fall apart and your brother would fall apart Sheesh, and I would man. fall apart and it would just create this never ending cycle. Mm. And so my mom did a good job of really masking the reality of what had happened. Even in our little apartment, she kept it, you know, well tailored, you know, she uh, brought a bunch of books from Nigeria and my, some of my dad's art and peppered it around the mm. apartment. She was always on us about keeping our rooms clean and keeping mm. the kitchen clean and all of these different things. So that that way, you know, we didn't have a sense of, mm. you know, where we were. It wasn't until I was about eight years old that that's when the reality hit me. Um, I remember a couple of things happened, but the one big thing that happened, I went to the basketball court um my mom allowed me started allowing me to venture off by myself and i started to see things you know like i get begin to see that oh that person that's strung out is not a uh, person that's just sick as my mom would say that person's a crackhead or mm. that person given that crackhead you know the bag of, uh, of of drugs is not giving him medicine is giving him you know crack cocaine mm. you know what i mean i've been people getting shot i begin to realize that this as i begin to venture off on my own and then i remember going to the basketball court one day and long story short i ended up getting beat to a pulp by mm. a guy who just got out of prison he was like 35 and a 19 year old and this kid who was my age and that's when everything kind of set in that's how, how old were you when you i was eight I, you were eight i was eight and years what, old they just beat you up yeah so i was playing basketball with this kid who's my age he might have been seven or eight years old but he was definitely around my age and uh we talking junk just you know as a kid does yeah, you know what sure. I mean? and uh 
if he's, he was talking junk when he was winning and then I started winning and I started talking junk and then uh, he told me to shut up and I said no, being a kid, not mm-hmm. thinking anything of it. He said, if you don't shut up, I'm going to get my brother. Mm. I said, all right, go get your brother. I don't care. And he came back with uh, with the dude. Um, dude with a grown man. Grown man, just got out of prison. And they beat me to a pole, slammed me on a concrete stone. Oh, my gosh. Out. Yeah, man. And that was my environment, you know. And then, <sighs> yeah, and so... Um, and I began to see my mom struggle around that time as well. Mm-hmm. I began to, you know, go with my mom to the rent office and hear how she would ask for extra time to pay the rent. Mm-hmm. And I began, my mom, there were times when my mom would just hand my brother and I a bar of ivory soap and say, hey, wash your underwear and socks because I can't afford to do laundry and wash mm-hmm. them out in the sink, you know. Mm-hmm. And there were times when my mom didn't have enough food to feed herself. She had just enough food to feed my brother and I. She would put the food on the table, split it between us, and stand in the doorway of the kitchen and mm-hmm. watch us eat, you know? Mm-hmm. And so as I begin to see those things and then that incident happened, that's when I realized I'm not in Nigeria anymore. We're not going to have the life that we used to have. And I don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And uh, that is when I can say that I unconsciously or subconsciously, whatever the right word is, chose to find a father. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I truly believe that Every boy needs a father, needs a man to teach him how to be a man. And every girl needs a father to teach her how to be loved by a man so that when she grows up, she chooses the right man. And it all comes back to affirmation. Mm. Because, you know, if you're not affirmed by your father, you will seek affirmation from other things and other people. Mm -hmm. And because I wasn't affirmed by my father because he passed away and because I didn't look to my heavenly father, uh, you know, as I should have, you know, uh, I began to look for a father and other things to fill that paternal void. Mm. And that's what led me to, you know, hip hop, man, mm. hip hop culture, street culture and, and and trying to mimic them. And so I started to listen against my mom's wishes, sneaking music into my uh, in my room and listening to Biggie and Pac mm-hmm. and, you know, Mob Deep and all of these guys and Nas. And I would hear him talk about sleeping with multiple girls. So that's what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I would hear him talk about selling drugs. So that's what I did. I sold drugs. I would hear him talk about punching people in the face if you feel disrespected. So I fought. I did all of those things. Mm. And, you know, by the time I was 19, I had built this massive illegal enterprise by selling drugs and selling illegal phones and doing all kinds of crazy things. Had a brand new Lincoln LS. And I loved, because of how much I loved hip hop, I started a record company called Eighth Wonder Entertainment. So I was, you know, laundering the money that I made illegally through the record company, mm-hmm. going down to, you know, uh, Virginia and doing um, recording in the studio, mm-hmm. buying studio time, you know, paying for, for my artists to get clothes so we can go do shows. And that was... I got out of control and it all came from that from filling that void with the wrong things you know man that's heavy Um, do you think that the life made you seek out art that was the soundtrack to your life and Mm -hmm. your environment or do you think the art influenced your environment because this is always a tricky yeah. question right when you start mm-hmm. talking about the influence of music yeah, yeah. is in, is the music just kind of a uh, a mirror yeah. a, a news story as of sorts yeah you know and obviously it's going to be hyperbolic and obviously yeah. like like the mafia yeah, movies yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. um but that doesn't mean that people aren't negatively influenced yeah, yeah, by yeah, those maf- yeah. mafia movies you know yeah. so which one would you say it was for you i would say it was influence it was influence. i would think i would say, oh maybe a combination i would say that you know i was seeking out something yeah but at the same time dude in the Bronx everybody is it's listening you, you can't walk down the street without hearing yeah Biggie mm-hmm. or without hearing Snoop or without hearing mm-hmm. these artists you know what I mean and and it's just and 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 that gets inside of you and influences you mm-hmm. you know and and you know case in point you know that's why you don't get in my opinion you don't get a lot of doctors and Mm -hmm. nurses and lawyer and navy seals Mm -hmm. out of these inner cities because they are those people are not there to influence that generation or influence the people to Uh, go down that path you know my brother you know ended up ended up becoming an engineer in part because he was somewhat influenced by my father and Mm -hmm. directly because when we were kids he would look through my father's papers and Mm -hmm. And, and and blueprints and all of these things and he was like oh this is cool like i want to so he was indirectly influenced so when i was out running the streets he would be in the library mm. you know and he ended up graduating high school in three years graduating getting a full ride academic scholarship to syracuse university graduating from there in three years and then ended up getting his master's in one year in, in, in computer science engineering all of that came from influence right and so i think that it's a, i think that it's a combination 
you're right. It's a, and it, I think it could be scaled like a percentage, you mm-hmm. know, whether it's 10%, 90 or 5%, mm-hmm. 95. Mm-hmm. But I would say a big part of it was influenced for me. Do you think there was ever a shift that happened? Because I remember yeah. uh, we're about the same age. Yeah, yeah. I remember a similar story. We came yeah. to America as refugees. Yeah, yeah. Um, we were under Soviet communism, yeah, yeah. so it wasn't, we didn't have nothing. Yeah, yeah, Everyone yeah. was lower middle class, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. there was corruption, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but we came, and my my dad wasn't in my life in the same way. And um, the gangster rap uh, w- definitely set me on a pretty dark trajectory. Yeah, I yeah, got yeah. arrested at age eleven, yeah, yeah. just wilding out. But I feel like there was a moment when I first started getting the I don't know if you ever got these. They were the um, the the you pay a penny for like oh yeah, yeah the yeah, cassettes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember the CDs that? CDs or the cassettes. What yeah, are those? What was that called? And you get like twelve of them yes. or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Um, I know what you talk about. It was like on, on a paper. You would fill yeah. out the paper. Yep. 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 And, then, yep. and then you check the little box yep. for which CDs or yep. tapes you wanted, yep. and then they were publishers. Was it wasn't clearing pub- house or something? something like that. Uh, uh, I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking. Long about. story short, I remember when I first started getting those and the first couple cassettes yeah. I got was like LL Cool J yeah, yeah, yeah. and like Public Enemy yeah, yeah. and you know what I mean? It yeah. was like it wasn't dark. It wasn't the, yeah, it wasn't the gangster stuff. Yeah, yeah and yeah. then like there was like I Shit, remember yeah. when my friend brought brought me like Snoop Dogg's doggy style. Like I remember. Yeah, when yeah, that, I, remember, I got in trouble with out. that one. Yeah. <laughs> my mom sort of when you pull out the yep. uh the whatever the pamphlet or yep, whatever and yep. it stretches out to this yep. comic strip and it got yeah yep. my mom saw that yeah. and she and I heard listening. that album before I heard The Chronic. Yeah. So I heard Doggy Stuff because The Chronic came yeah. out first. And then I remember going to, I think they did like a tour and I was at the San Diego yeah. Sports Arena. I, yeah. Bro, I, I couldn't have been older than nine. Wow, wow. And like one of the only kids in the crowd. Yeah. Sweet smoke everywhere. So, but I still had to say like, there seems to have been a shift. Like there seems yeah. to have been like Public Enemy yeah. and KRS-One yeah. and LL Cool J. Yeah. And and it was still an edge to it, yeah, yeah, yeah. to like we yeah. shooting and yeah, yeah, killing yeah, yeah, yeah. and 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 yeah. like gangs, yeah, like yeah, yeah. what ha- what happened? Like I mean, you were closer to it. You're in the yeah. Bronx, which yeah. is like the or you know the 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 mecca yeah, of hip hop, yeah. if you will. I Did th- you see that shift? Oh, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. I think what it boiled down to was artists started pulling from what they saw in their environment, and they started realizing that that this is what people want. You know what I mean? Like this is the people like the negativity. Mm. You know what I mean? Even now, when you, you know, you hear some of these songs and and, and these lyrics, and it's a forty-one year old dude. I'm like, why would anybody be mm-hmm. support that or spend money on that? That's yeah. like negative. It degrades. It's even like, especially it degrades the African American community. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, why would anybody like pay into that? Mm-hmm. And it's like because. People like what's controversial. Like people are yeah. drawn to that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Exactly. But the trip, the trippy yeah. part is then the art, which is hyperbolic. Yeah, yeah. As art tends to be. Yeah. Even if you're trying to capture a realism to it, it's yeah. still going. It's still it's still kind of a caricature to yeah, some yeah, extent. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Snoop wasn't really out here. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, like killing people. Yeah. yeah, yeah like it's, it's still yeah, yeah. hyperbole. Yeah, yeah. It's like the WWE. Yeah. And then there's actual guys that like are real. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're like yeah. you just kind of stumbled into rap. Yeah, yeah, you know, you yeah, ain't really an entertainer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just a, a street guy who yeah, raps, right? Yeah. But remove that decades later, yeah. and now if I'm looking at it, there is now a real there's real pockets of culture that are influenced by the art. Yeah. yeah. The art, which was a caricature, yeah, yeah. has created yeah, a yeah. hyper caricature. Yeah. 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 Of yeah. real people that yeah. really live this way, exactly, and it's such a bizarre, it's nuts, man. You know, it's such a bizarre thing that's just kind of compounded and, and compounded yeah. and compounded. And now it's like you got you got kids getting murdered. You got you got yeah. literal kids in the yeah. Bronx, yeah, yeah. 15, yeah. 14, 16 years yeah. old that are committing these terrible acts. Yeah, yeah, because and you get people that are posting these rap songs and dissing somebody and then they get found walking yeah. out and then they get right. shot it's right. bro it's at the end of the day it all comes back to that to the devil you yeah. know what i'm saying yeah. and, my, and you know the it's, destroy still killing it's, destroy yep, yeah yeah and lust yeah. of the eyes you know yeah. lust of the eyes and uh, even the soul the concept you know what i mean like you know going back to this is what people want like people want us all mm-hmm. like god was like yo you know you know what's gonna happen if you get a king. Yeah. They, he's gonna mm-hmm. the king's gonna take this from you yep. and pose yep. yep. his yep. will and yep. that. People are like, we don't care, we want we want the and yep. they got it. Yep. And then so it's like 
it's part of our nature to want things we shouldn't want. Yeah. That's why one thing I always say, it's hard to do the right thing. It's so easy to always do the wrong thing. Yep. Because yep. that's just the nature and the flow of life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's tricky. I yeah. think the, the the error that people then make, and I've seen it made yeah. recently by an influencer named Sneeko. Yeah. And he was on um No Jumper Adam 22. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that podcast. I, I've heard of the podcast. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was on there and he and he made this conflation. I didn't react to it, but mm. but but I, I I now that we're talking about it, it just came yeah. to mind. Where he then conflated rap culture mm. or like a very specific pocket of rap culture yeah. with like black people. Huh. You know what I mean? And it's yeah, like I don't the, understand that. What, the, what do you mean by that? So he said, like, well, black culture is degenerate and rap culture is degenerate. Got and it. he just kind of made this like hasty generalization got it, got conflating it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. what we're talking about of like a very specific pocket of of hyperbolic art that then just kind of crescendo yeah. out of control yeah, over yeah, decades yeah, yeah. and then conflated that with all hip hop. And then two conflated hip hop culture yeah. with black culture. Got it. Got and it's it, like got these it, got are it. there's there's layers to this yeah, stuff. Like, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, 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 most sure. most uh, black folks that I knew that I that, that I grew up around yeah. were extremely religious. Yeah, yeah. Tended to be more conservative. Yeah, yeah. And weren't rocking with the foolishness yeah, yeah, in the gangster rap. They especially were like, their parents. Especially <laughs> parents. Right. And so it's like these yeah. folks are now probably in their 50s, 60s. Yeah. So when I was a kid, right, they were the 30s, 40s. Mm -hmm. But there was a massive disconnect. And yeah. so to the conflation, so I, I say all that to say, like, I think this then becomes weaponized yeah, yeah. to to dismiss one an art form. Yeah. That's not all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then two, people, like yeah. like real people yeah, that yeah. like black people aren't a part of this, yeah, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, what do you what do you what do you make of that? And just how, to your point, how yeah. like the enemy is so manipulative. 100%. You know I mean, what I mean? Yeah, so it's yeah. like now, because it creates these bizarre biases against yeah. people. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, the Bible, he comes as an angel of light, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And uh, all of that is, at the, end of the at the end of the day, the path is destruction. And yeah. when you look at it all, for the most part, it leads to destruction in a lot of our community, African-American yeah. communities. Yeah. Like, look at Chicago, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. You get these. I remember listening to this guy, and he was talking about how he interviewed a, a, a gang member out of L.A. Mm -hmm. And the gang member said, before he, before as they were driving around to to look for somebody that they were gonna kill, mm -hmm. they would pump Tupac. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah, and blast that. it yeah, yeah, so yeah. that they can get into they get the mood, yep. so that yep. that way they can go destroy and kill. Right, right, you know what I mean? Right. So yeah, I, I think that it's it's all a ploy from the enemy. And I think that there are different levels to it. I think that once but it's so easy to get in mm -hmm. and then and then move straight up to the negative right. side of right, it. Right. 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 Where, 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 you know it's it's like it's like that gr it's not a gradual shift into the darkest side yeah. of it. It's yeah. like just give you just take a taste yeah. of it. Yeah. And once you get a taste, if you're not strong enough, right. you're gonna you're gonna jettison to the top. And when I say jettison, I don't mean be a rapper. I yeah. mean like follow what you yeah. listen to yeah. to a T. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So do you did you ever grow up um like I remember yeah. late nineties, there was there was a shift to me, yeah. for me personally that happened, where I was listening to Jay Z and I was listening to to Biggie and of course Tupac yeah. being on the West Coast, but then there was like a there was this there was this wave of like De La Soul. Most Def, yeah, yeah, Talib yeah, Quali, yeah, Black yeah, Star, yeah, The Roots, yeah. Tribe um, Called Quest. Tribe Called yeah, Quest. Yeah, yeah. Q Tip had put out a yeah. solo album around yeah. that time. And there was this there was this uh Neo Soul, Neo Soul kind of yeah, overlap, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So like so so my yeah. perception of hip hop wasn't yeah. like I was like, Oh, that's gangster rap. Like yeah. that ain't really yeah. this. You yeah. know, so yeah. I always had a more positive interaction with it. And yeah. then I got saved. Yeah. And so when I got saved, I was like, Oh, this can be used and redeemed yeah. and, and used onto the glory of God. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is ninety nine, two thousand, two thousand one, kind of the window I got saved in. Got it, got it, got were it. you were you were were you um kind of a part of that? Yeah, I would listen to it. Um especially the the feel good stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was like, for example, Dear Mama, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that for, by yeah, Tupac. That wasn't like, so it was stuff like that that mm -hmm. I would listen to, but also the Neo Soul that would influence me in a positive way, mm -hmm. and I would kick it to and lounge mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I definitely fell into that yeah. into that type of music. Yeah, 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 yeah man. Yeah. It's interesting. Sorry, I'm asking yeah. you all these hip hop, nah, you're good, you're hip -hop good. questions. Nah, you're good. Nah, uh, that's from our from our time period. Yeah. Man. yeah. So you. Yeah. At this point, start investing in music. Start investing in music. Start a record company yeah. called Eighth Wonder Entertainment. Which is 
extremely common. Yeah. I don't think yeah. people understand yeah. how many record labels without talking telling on yeah. anybody were funded yeah, yeah. by street guys. So yeah, yeah. You yeah, know yeah. what I mean? And that was the goal. That was my, you know, like Jay and Dame. They had their plan. Hey, mm -hmm. we're gonna hustle. We're gonna mm -hmm. sell drugs. We're gonna we're gonna get these. Uh, we're gonna get these CDs made. Sell them on the street. Mm -hmm. Make money that way. And the end goal was to build Rockefeller mm -hmm. and get a label deal with Def Jam. Mm -hmm. And that was my plan. My plan was I had my exit because I knew at some point Jig's gonna be up. Mm -hmm. Somebody's you know somebody's gonna get caught mm -hmm. and somebody's gonna end up. As a matter of fact, there were people who were doing what I was doing and they were getting caught, prosecuted, and sent to federal prison. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I, I so I knew that I had to have an exit plan, mm -hmm. and that was it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I love music and I love the idea of being like P Diddy. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And all of these guys that did the legal thing but used the legal thing to get them into mm -hmm. onto the right path. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, man, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I uh, I was I when I really went down the rabbit hole of yeah. like who were yeah. the, the, the founders of a lot of these yeah. labels. I'm like, yeah. it's a lot of street money. Oh, yeah, yeah. If, look at 50, you know, yeah. and what he did with G-Unit. Look at uh, Murder, Inc., yeah. Yeah. you know what I mean, yeah. and and, yeah. and what they did. And even if you go down to the South and start looking at what is the cash money, mm -hmm. you know, how they got their mm -hmm. start, the foundation. That seed money isn't, yeah. wasn't all clean money. You Do know you know think I mean? the difficulty of being an entrepreneur mm. is still hard right whether you're selling less of the eyes less of the flesh pride of life mm. so i can roll uh versus an actual legit venture there still requires some degree of entrepreneurial oh, grit oh, yeah, to yeah. be able to do, do that yeah, to do that you know what i mean yeah. and so I just, I just think about to your point the communities yeah. like how much of that can be redirected yeah to saying hey instead of going into the illegal activities how about you you channel this into productive activities that yeah, yeah. could actually change yeah you know your legacy now for sure now i i think it all comes back to what are you selling mm. you know what i mean i don't think that it says I don't think it's more challenging or less challenging. I think that it all goes back to what are you selling? Mm -hmm. And one thing, you know, I, I own a consulting company where I provide, you know, uh, mental toughness, critical thinking, team building, leadership training to Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. I've been doing that for like the last, I don't know, five, six years mm -hmm. and just did a massive pharmaceutical company in January with mm -hmm. all their executives and vice presidents. And, you know, one thing I always tell my clients is, People don't buy products. People don't buy services. People buy people. Mm, that's people good. buy stories. That's good. That's what they buy. When you look at whatever product you you look at, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a Coca Cola, whether it's whatever it is, people buy the story that's behind good. the product, that's which good. is a person's story. Yes. And so I think that it's all about how you're telling your story, the story of your of you, and mm -hmm. and how you connect to that product. That's going to dictate whether it's mm, hard to sell as an entrepreneur or whether it's whether it's easier yeah, to yeah, sell. So yeah. I don't think that it, there's been like a big shift where it's harder now or yeah. it's harder selling drugs sure. than it is selling. Sure. I mean, it's it's hard to sell drugs and not end up in prison. Yeah. But, you know, it's hard to sell anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard to sell anything. It yeah. takes a degree of organization, a degree yeah. of grit, a degree of delaying gratification, yeah, yeah. all those different things. So how does the 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 business of music venture play out for you? Yeah. So. Um, it's a lot more to the stories all in my book transform but in short um ended up getting involved in, in a deal with a drug dealer i sold them some products that were supposed to last for 90 days products only lasted for two weeks a short amount of time mm -hmm. you know he had in return flipped those products so he owed some people some money and my life was threatened my mom's life was indirectly threatened i was 19 at the time and that was like that was a huge wake up call for me. That's when I decided, all right, let me get this guy's money and get out of the game because if not, I'm going to end up dead or in prison. I gave him his money back, and then that's when I went 110 percent trying to sell, trying to get a label deal. Went to MCA, mm -hmm. got a meeting at MCA, had the had this compilation album that I put together. I had like six or seven artists, so each artist had like two songs. Mm -hmm. Some artists had one song, and. Uh, Pitch it to MCA, they passed, went to Def Jam, never forget, uh, sat down in the Def Jam office. I remember walking through the hallways and seeing all these platinum and gold records as I'm mm -hmm. walking through the Def Jam offices. And I, it was at, at nighttime, got a meeting with Kevin Lyles. Wow, um, that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was massive and uh, sat down with him, played the CD for him. He's nodding his head like, cool. And then about halfway through the compilation album, he stops and then he says, hey, this is good, but you want to hear something better? And as soon as he said that, I knew that we weren't going to mm. get a label deal. And the funny thing is, he played a, a, a new artist that hadn't come out yet named Joe Buttons. Really? Yep. 
he played Joe what Button's trip. first sing, single that had, I don't even think it had been fully mixed and mastered yet. Huh. It was like a raw cut. Uh -huh. They said, this guy right here, he's going to be the biggest thing. He's going to be the next J. He's going to be X, Y, and Z. You need to come back with something like this. Whoa. And, uh, and play, he, did he play you Pump It Up? Uh, what I, that, that was his first single. Yeah, pump, I think it was pump, that. Yeah, pump, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, it was yeah. that one. Wow. And uh, that that's what really ended my music career because... I didn't have, I ran out of money. Mm -hmm. You know, I was making tens of thousands of dollars a week. Mm -hmm. And that's how I was able to fund all of the stuff I was funding. So, you know, obviously I wasn't smart with my money being 19, you know yeah, what I mean? Sure. So I was blowing on bought a brand new 2001 Lincoln LS car and mm -hmm. was going to clubs and, and, you know, getting bottle services, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Even though I'm 19, not 21. Mm -hmm. Like I was, I was burning, I had burned through a lot of my money. So, mm -hmm. um, for six months, you know, tried the record, tried to sell a company, didn't work. Not tried to sell it, but tried to get a label deal, didn't work out. And then finally, that's when I was like, you know what, I need to do something else or because this ain't working out for me. Mm. Yeah. And is that when you went into the yeah, Navy? That's when I went into the Navy. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. a lot more to the story. So essentially. And you're, and you're in New York this whole time? I'm in New York City. Okay. In the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm, at 19, you go into the military. 19, at 19, um, it's a whole God story behind it, but in short. It was June of 2002. I was in my bed early morning. Just kind of woke up, was still kind of between sleep and just, just you know, somewhat awake. And I heard this voice speak to me. Mm. And that voice said to me, you need to get out of here. You, join, you need to join the military. Mm. Like literally, no exaggeration. Wow. And you, are you saved at this point? No, no. no. Wow. I, didn't get, I didn't come to Christ. This is 2002. I didn't come to Christ until 2008. Whoa. And so I'm like, like I hear this voice and I yeah. like, Prop myself up in the bed. I'm like, where did that come from? Yeah. And I looked around. It was it felt like a male's voice. Yeah. Nobody in my room. I went to my window. My window was open. We lived on the third floor. So I was like, oh, maybe it's somebody talking to somebody outside. When I looked out the window, didn't see anybody mm -hmm. outside. And then like that, it was like that seed had been planted and it just started germinating in my mm -hmm. head. Like mm -hmm. that word, you know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. why I, in retrospect, I know, it was, I know it was the word of God. Wow. You know what I'm saying? How cool is it that yeah. God is leaning in and, yeah. and, and, and giving you guidance even when, when you, you don't aren't know walking him. with him exactly. and don't know him? Exactly. That's powerful. And I always go to Romans 8, 28, which, you know, a lot of people quoted, you know, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God, but they forget the rest of it. And, and those who are called according, according to his purposes yeah. for yeah. them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Yep. And yep. so, like, I didn't love God, but yeah. I was called according to his purposes. Yeah. And so, um, so it's, it, like, I just remember arguing with, with the idea because I hated the cops. I associated anybody in a uniform as the police, whether you were the Marine Corps, Navy, whatever you mm -hmm. were. Mm -hmm. uh, I hated authority. I liked my clothes baggy, my hats backwards. I still wear my hats backwards. And I would always make fun of the ROTC kids in high school because they were always with the tight uniforms. They were always the nerdy kids with the glasses. The you know, like the, the funny thing is yeah. those kids, it, it, like as a grown man yeah. looking back, like that's actually cool. Exactly. You know what I exactly, mean? But in exactly. high school, you're yeah, right. Like, yeah, yeah, we yeah, were looking at them kind of yeah, cool, corny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, man. And so I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't yeah. want to be that. Yeah. But then I looked around the room. I grew up in the same room that I, you know, you know, when I was eight years old, I broke down and started realizing my dad's not coming back. And I and I stared at my dad's picture and I said, you know, what else are you going to do with your life? Your life has amounted to nothing. You're 19, about to turn 20 in mm. August. Mm. And, you know, your brother's in college. What are you going to do? Yeah. The interesting thing is that yeah. your brother is there. And there, so there there was seemingly an alternative path. Oh, 100%. You could have went. Yeah. yeah. But because of inaction or lack of vision, or I'm not yeah. sure what it was, but you decided to go to street route. Your brother goes to. Yeah, my brother. So what, my brother route. had a huge wake up call when he was about. Maybe it might have been around the same time I had mine, maybe eight, nine. No, he, he's a year old than me. So like 10 or 11. Mm -hmm. He stuttered really, really bad as a kid. Mm. And um, um, he wasn't doing good in school. And my mom one day came home and she saw his report card and she just broke down crying. Mm. And she said, Bio, like, I need you. You're the older brother. I need you to do good. I need you to do good in school because you need to become somebody. You need to set the right example for your little brother. Mm. And a switch went off in my brother's head. And from that moment on, he, like, when I was outside playing, he was at the library. You know, because I think my mom, that word, hey, 
you are in charge. You are the leader. Mm. You are setting an example. I think that got into his spirit, mm. and uh, and he would he would study nonstop. Mm. He would go from from school to the library, library home, school. Even in the summertime, he was in the library. Sheesh. And we I used to make fun of him. Yeah. All my friends used to be call his pinky in the brain because the dude was <laughs> was brilliant. You know, he, that's a, that was a dope yeah, show. Yeah, a lot of people ain't gonna yeah. catch that one, yeah, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So so. And that's why he was able to graduate high school in three years. Wow. And college in three years and yeah. master's in one year, you yeah. know, because he, my mom untapped the potential within him with that. And he got, he got rid of the stuttering as well. Mm. You know what I mean? So, mm. um, so yeah. you're, you're, you're having kind of a similar epiphany around the same age. Yeah. 19, about to be 20. And you're like, yo, I'm going to go to the military. Yeah. So I went, I uh, decided, okay, screw it. I ain't got nothing left. Ran down the street I, I grew up on, went to the uh, Marine recruiter's office first. That's why I know it was God, because the door was open, the coffee was on the desk. I sat there for like 15 minutes, nobody showed up. Mm. Got up, walked uh, walked a, few, a door down to the Army recruiter office. Guy was in there, I was like, hey, you know, when's this guy coming back from the Marines? And he kind of scoffed at me. So I, I felt disrespected. Went back to Marine Corps recruiter's office, sat for another 10 minutes, nobody showed up. Then I went two doors down to the Navy recruiter's office. Gorgeous Navy recruiter mm. in there named Tiana Nadine Reyes. Um, as soon as I see her, I'm like, yo. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's always a girl. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, yo, <laughs> forget just getting in the Navy. And uh, she asked me what I wanted to do. I was like, yo, I want to be a Navy SEAL because I saw I, I watched a movie years earlier called uh, The Rock. Uh -huh. And that was my first exposure to Navy SEALs. Uh, so so that seed had got planted in my mind. So, so, you, said, so you know you want to be a Navy SEAL out the rip. Yeah, because a lot yeah, of folks kind of go yeah. in the Navy and then kind of like, oh, I guess I'll try out, yeah, right? Yeah, but you knew out the yeah, rip. Yeah, when I went to Navy, at first I went to Marine Corps recruiters office. I, I didn't. I thought Navy SEALs were. I didn't know that you had to be in the Navy. Mm. I just and I and I and I had heard, which is true, that the Marines are a department of the Navy. So the Marines actually fall into the Navy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so like I didn't know that there was that I had to be in the Navy Navy to be a SEAL. I mm -hmm. thought I could be in the Marines. That's mm -hmm. why I went to the Marine recruiter mm -hmm. office first. Okay, and so um, I went in there and spoke to her. I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna be a Navy SEAL." I'm showing her my muscle, and she's laughing, and she knew exactly what to do with me because she was from the Bronx. She grew up in the okay. Bronx, you know, left to go join the Navy, did her time in the fleet, and then went back to the Bronx to be a recruiter. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing she had me do was she had me do a practice ASVAB test, took mm -hmm. that test. I scored high enough to get in the Navy, but I didn't score high enough to go get in the SEAL training. Got to score really high. Uh, it's like an SAT. Mm -hmm. And then she ran my background. Ran my background, found I had two warrants off of my arrest. Jeez. Yeah, I had a warrant in New York, and I had a warrant in New Jersey. Oh, man. And when she said that, like, I immediately got hot because I thought that it was for the stuff that some other people I was working with got caught up for. Mm -hmm. You know, because I was I was six months out, so I figured, you know, I got charged, and I just I charged never made it to my house, and now there's these warrants out for my arrest. So I got up, ran, ran towards the door, and she stopped me. She's and she said, "Where are you going?" I said, "I'm getting out of here." She said, "Do you have a suit?" I said, "No." She said, "Do you have a nice shirt and some nice pants?" I said, "I'm sure I can find something." And she said, "Come back tomorrow." I'm like, "For what?" <laughs> you know, she's like, she snapped me. She's like, "Just come back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Shut up and come back tomorrow, okay?" And you know, growing up in the streets of the Bronx. You have to learn how to read people, mm -hmm. especially when you're hustling like I was. Because mm -hmm. if not, you know, you, you can end up dead or end up selling something to an undercover cop, end up locked up. So I learned how to read people, which would serve me well when I got into human intelligence as a SEAL, mm -hmm. really, really well in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know exactly what she was going to do for me, but I knew that whatever it was, her reaction told me it would be good. Mm. And so I came back the next day and she was in her dress uniform she took me to both judges. She took me to the judge in Jersey first, stood before him, you know, said, hey, 9-11 happened nine months earlier. This kid's made mistakes, but he still has potential. He wants to join, some, join the military after an act of war. Can't join with these warrants. Would you clear his record? Whoa. The judge was like, yo, this guy's serious about joining the military after 9-11. How serious were the charges? Uh, they were. One was, it was the, the first one, I can't remember if it was a I don't even miss me. It was like reckless driving. I was okay. doing like, I was doing like 120 and okay. like a 65. Hey, he was wild. Yeah, it was, he was, it was crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't like you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't nothing. Yeah, it wasn't great. But the second charge, I won't give it away because that's going to be in the movie. Okay. Uh, but uh, the second charge was was, was it was, was more bad. serious. Yeah, it wasn't rape or murder or anything, but yeah. it was it was a bad charge. Okay. People find out when they when they when okay. they read the book or watch the movie. Yep, but yep, um, yep. um, but yeah, man, I uh, I uh, she took me to New York. 
found out what the charges were, said this, gave the same spiel. And, it, and when she did that, the, the courthouse was blocks away from ground zero, mm. which again, this is showing how God brings all together. The architect of the Twin Towers was my dad's good friend wow. who designed my dad's Twin Towers. Wow. The Twin Towers coming down, not saying this is a good thing, played a role in why I was able to get my record expunged to join the Navy. You know what I mean? Like who can? How, you know what I mean? You can't make that up. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, after that, judge said the same thing in New York. Hey, I'll clear his record. She went a step further, fudged the paperwork, snuck me into the Navy. Mm. And I and I say I tell that whole story. What do you mean fudged the paperwork, snuck you? Because in? even with my record expunged, it takes a time for that to show up in the system. Oh, okay. She was able to get that cleared quick, but then also. Even with it expunged, you're still not allowed. Like, you got to fill out this form. And mm -hmm. on the form, it asks you, have you ever had a record sealed, expunged, yeah, yeah, yeah. any of that stuff? And if you check yes, it screws you. Because the reason why they wanted, they need to be able to see your record. They need to be able to see what you did mm. so that they can know whether you're eligible to get in or get in or not. Mm -hmm. And so she kind of fudged all that paperwork mm -hmm. and got it all cleared in time for me to be able to get into the Navy. Wow. And that's how I got so she was finessing, just trying to look out for you. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Because she was from the Bronx and she knew nobody else would give me a shot. Now here's the crazy thing why I say this whole thing is God. I get me I've I get messages to this day mm -hmm. from kids from around America who say, dude, like I read your book, heard your story, like I, like I had the same problem. I want to get out of the hood. Mm. I want to join the Army, Marine mm. Corps, and they won't touch me mm. because of this mistake I made as a kid, misdemeanor. You know, I made, I threatened my girlfriend, got charged, and now, yeah. like, yeah. you know, no recruiter can't touch me. God gave me that word at the perfect time because I showed up in the Marine Corps' office, office at the perfect time. Mm. If that Marine Corps recruiter was in there, he wouldn't have done what he did for me. Mm. I would have been blacklisted, mm. never would have been able to join the military. Mm. I, and God had me be in front of Tiana mm. at the perfect time. Here's another crazy thing. She died two years after that. Really? Yeah, of, wow. auto, of an autoimmune disease. Oh, man. And I, I met her brother, um, you know, years later. And when I connected with him and told him what she did for me, he's like, yo, bro. He was like, she did that for me. Wow. I got misdemeanor charges. She was. She flew from from her duty station to New York. St you know, took me to the judge, got my record, mm. you know, cleared, and got me in the Air Force. Mm. He was like, "Yo, she would drive around the Bronx and tell drug dealers, other people we grew up with, yo, come with me, let's get out of here." Mm -hmm. He's like, "That's what she did." And God had spoken to me at that perfect time for me to get into her office mm -hmm. so I could meet just her specifically. Mm. And keep in mind, it was not just one recruiter mm -hmm. that works in an office. It's like six, seven, mm -hmm. eight of them. Mm -hmm. yep. And she was the only one in the office at that time I went in. Yeah. And the guy who was the Marine Corps recruiter who was who was uh, absent, yeah. uh, he walked by while she was doing my background or yeah. whatever, not my background, but had me do the ASVAP at some period. He walked by and was like, hey, what's up, Tiana? Mm. And then he went back to his office. Mm -hmm. So he was there. So I say all that to say it was all, everything yeah. works together for yep. the good of those yeah. who love God. Yeah. That's so cool, man. My, I, I, a cl close friend of mine is um yeah. is a uh, army recruiter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's in uh, Cleveland. Okay. And, um, you know, he's he's talked about yeah, yeah. Just, just what it's like being in these communities yeah. man, and how much of a out this could be for people, yep, yep, you know, to change yep. their life around. You yeah, know? man, for sure. I think people forget how uh, how it can be when you don't see other options, yeah. whether or not there yeah, are other yeah, options, yeah. but perception becomes reality yeah, for people. Yeah, 100%. You know? So that's so dope, man. And even now, you know, like, it's a national security issue because mm -hmm. recruiting is down across the board, mm -hmm. across every branch of service. And there's a lot of kids who, yeah, they made mistakes, but they can still be eligible to join mm -hmm. and help get our recruiting numbers back to where they need to be. So something needs to change because, and that's and that was the, my motivation for being Johnny on the spot when mm. I was in mm. and doing everything with excellence and not talking back and not, you know, reverting back to my, you know, New York hustle streetways sure. because I didn't want to make a decision that would get me kicked out or prove to the Navy, see, 
it's a reason why we don't allow people to join who have these records right. or make these mistakes. Right. This is the reason why. Yeah. So that's why I yeah. chose to excel. Yeah, that's dope. Um, mm. So I want to get more into the Navy SEAL yeah. story, how you go from regular Navy, Navy SEAL, yeah. and then obviously, you know, finishing the SEALs, going yeah. into uh, uh, Hollywood and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Talking about you going into the Navy. Yeah. Uh, and this is 2002? 2002, yep. July 2002. 2002, yep. July 2002, you go into the Navy. A uh, recruiter does a good job with helping yeah. you um, get get your way in there. Yep, yep. Now, what was that experience like? And then what was it like becoming a SEAL? Because I'm, I'm assuming there's some time in between that. Yeah, yeah. So um, got to boot camp. Um, it was easy for me, at least, because it's like I'm, I'm, I turned 20 in boot camp. So mm-hmm. all the kids I'm in boot camp where if they're like 17, mm-hmm. just out of high school, so I'm, you know, hearing kids cry at night, and it's just funny to me. Push-ups, all that stuff didn't bother me. Running, all that stuff didn't bother me. Um, uh, Navy SEAL came to our uh, division and played us played a video of what SEALs do. Showed us guys skydiving, um, scuba diving underwater, driving, doing buggies, long hair, suppressed guns, all that. That's when I was, like, even more so, like, this is what I want to do. Mm. Uh, but I couldn't go take the – because after he played the video, he uh, – gave an opportunity for the guys who wanted to go uh, screen for it because mm-hmm. do the screening test to, to leave. And I was I, I couldn't go because I didn't have the ASVAB score uh, and I was super skinny and I couldn't swim. Mm. So I had to sit there with all the guys who had no desire to be an operator mm-hmm. and that kind of crushed me. But that was also like motivation for me. And so um, graduated boot camp with the A school. I was a corpsman, so I went to medical A school. Uh, not like med school, but like it's like – training to be a medical assistant type deal or a, uh, a combat medic. Hmm. And then from there, I went to uh, my first command, which was Naval Hospital Camp Pendleton. And when I got there... Which is which is like 10, like, 15 yeah. minutes from here. Yeah, right, yeah. There, right down the street, man. Yep. And uh, it was a blessing, man, because I got stationed at the hospital and at the, there's a new hospital now that's right by the that first gate. Mm-hmm. But back in the day, the old hospital was like in the boondocks of Camp Pendleton. Like mm-hmm. once you drive through that first gate, you still got like another 30 minutes before you even get yeah. to the hospital. Yeah, and Camp Pendleton's huge. It's huge, it's yeah. massive. And so um, I remember getting there the first night, and I was just like, dang, like, what am I going to, like, because all it was was this, the barracks, parking lot, a track, mm-hmm. and then right across the street was a hospital, and then everything else was all, like, wilderness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, and so my first day there, I went to my leading petty officer, and I said, hey, I want to train and be a frogman. Mm-hmm. Um is there any way you could change my schedule? And so she did. So I would work four hours in the morning at the family practice clinic. I have four hours off in the afternoon to train. And then I would come back and work the night clinic until like for four hours or until the last patient left. Mm -hmm. And yeah, man, I I, I went to, um, uh, took the bus to the other side, main side, bought an ASVAP for Dummies book, uh, bought a Bud's 234 Navy SEAL documentary. um, And I would watch that documentary and create workouts and I would study that ASVAB book. I didn't have a car. I would run three miles uphill to the pool, jump in the shallow end, try to figure it out, run three miles back. And I just did that relentlessly, Mm. you know, for six months. And then six months, you know, after checking in, I qualified to get in the SEAL training. I scored high enough on that. I retook the ASVAB, scored high enough to pass the screening test and essentially got orders. And then within mm. a year of checking into the command, I was checking out on my way to SEAL training. Mm. So that was that was the gap of time. And it was it was rough, man. I mean, but I tell people all the time, you know, when you have a dream, you're gonna have obstacles on the journey towards that dream. Otherwise not a dream, mm. otherwise it's not a dream. And you can make one or two choices. You could throw your hands up and say, Yo, I ain't never gonna be able to do this. Mm. Or you could say, Hey, I'm going to do the extra hard work in order to overcome my deficiencies yeah. or these obstacles, and that's what I chose to do. Yeah. And uh, got to SEAL training. It was a kick in the nuts. Uh, it was horrible. Yeah. Um, I, heard, I heard SEAL training is nuts. Yeah, it was. Now, now, now yeah. I don't want to brush over this. Yeah. Did you teach yourself how to swim? Yeah, so for, when I, for the first time. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Because yeah. you just kind of just yeah, said yeah. that so casually. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't swim. Yeah. And you taught yourself how to swim. Yeah, yes and no. So first two months is when I, when I kind of taught myself, and then I got – Pretty pretty good, and yeah. then after two months, what I was still struggling with was the distances, mm. the distance swimming, and so I started talking to the lifeguard, mm. and I would just from the pool, I would just hey hey what what I'm doing critique me, and the lifeguard would kind of critique my stroke after I did a lap and tell me what what to do better, what to do different, mm-hmm. and then uh, a month after that, 
this lieutenant colonel who would see me running uphill from the from my barracks to the pool. He mm -hmm. would drive by me. You know, he saw me in the uh, locker room at the pool one day. He's like, dude, what are you training for? You trying to be a recon Marine? Mm -hmm. I was like, nah, I'm trying to be a SEAL. He's like, need some help? I was like, sure. And then he started like kind of coaching me a little wow. bit to help tighten me up more. Yeah. So that was the kind of progression of yeah. it. Yeah. How, <laughs> tell me the, 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 the gap between regular boot camp to yeah. be go, join the Navy and uh, it's, Navy you, SEAL. You can't, you can't, <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's like it's heaven and hell, bro. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 completely different i mean just to put things into perspective the attrition rate in boot camp is like if you have a division of 300 guys maybe 295 will finish okay so that's a really yeah, small I mean, five guys drop out yeah that's yeah, really and, low and those are guys who are like they claim mental illness so they can get kicked out or you know they have an injury or whatever the case may be in seal training you start out with 270 you graduate my class graduated 29 no yeah every class is like whoa 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 yeah, whoa yeah. 270 yep. to 29 yeah that's what my class my class started are they out trying to weed out as yeah, many 100%, people so they're 100%. trying to break you yeah yeah they're trying to see who doesn't have what it takes i mean it's it's wow considered the toughest military training on a man this class is now like there was a class this winter uh who went through hell week and i think they started with like 200 mm -hmm. Uh, 14 made it through hell week and that and that's just hell week they still got to go through the rest of first phase die phase and third phase so that's that's Sheesh, man. That, that's the program man that's that's why i say it's, it's night and day between boot camp yeah. and buds you yeah know i mean guys have been permanently crippled from the program guys mm. have died in i mean god died in my first class really yeah rob vetter he'd be i mean he, he was running on the beach heart gave out <gasps> they were hammering us in between the run and he i mean Dropped dead right in front of us. Oh my gosh! They were we were able to like perform CPR. The um, buds uh, instructor Corman came up, provided some um, more aid. They were able to get a pulse, but he had been out so long. But that by the time they got him to the hospital, he was they had, had the he was a vegetable, God. and then and then they ended up you know uh, pulling him off life support. You know about a week later. Oh my gosh! Yeah, man. So I mean it's it's and it's that's that's awful. It's, a, it's brutal, bro. I mean it's it's it's. But it's it's necessary. Huh. It's necessary because what they're trying to do is they're trying to break you down to your lowest point, but still expect you to perform to a, a high standard. Mm. Because that's the type of jobs we do. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not doing jobs where uh, that are easy. Mm -hmm. We're doing the jobs where you're sneaking in at you know, and one, two in the morning, and you're going into a spot where it's going to be a lot of bad guys. You got to get one guy. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing ops where you got to come over the beach, wet, cold, sandy, and that's just insert. And then you got to go hit the target. We're doing those jobs that are like, yeah. hey, you know, yeah. kicking the nuts, bro. Well, I, think, <laughs> I think it's interesting how much people take for granted. Yeah how fragile yeah. and delicate and dark yeah. the world is yeah. that uh our freedoms yeah. our luxuries yeah. are often kept intact and the world is kept in order yeah yeah our quality of life yeah. by guys like you that yeah. went in and yeah. did some of the hardest training ever yeah. you know like yeah. i think we forget how chaotic and 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 how fast things can hit the fan oh, if yeah. there wasn't dudes that are like i'm yeah. gonna go lay everything down yeah. become the elite of the elite yeah. so that there could be order yeah. so that we could fight for our freedom yeah man yeah man that's spot on it's uh i, I am but for us we don't even look at it like that we just look at it like hey we're just doing a job yeah that's crazy well yeah, thank yeah, you for yeah, doing yeah, that yeah, job it's just a job that's I mean? crazy that you yeah. you yeah that's that's yeah. interesting yeah that's yeah. interesting because i think yeah. from the outside in yeah. I, I would look at the military and be like Everything you just described, you said it's necessary, yeah. right? It's, it's hard, necessary, but it's yeah. necessary. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I definitely think we take that for granted. Yeah. Like, I think people don't real, especially folks who haven't traveled internationally. Yeah. Like, yeah. I was just in Israel oh, yeah, in yeah, October. Yeah. We was all in the Gaza Strip. They're yeah. showing us the rockets that got shot yeah, over. I'm like, yo, yeah. Yeah. it go, and we left, and there was rockets being shot yeah. over from Gaza, yeah, right? Yeah, like, yeah, near yeah. where we are. Like, it can yeah. go left yeah. very yeah, fast. Yeah, and yeah. I think most people don't realize yeah. how on the cusp of, a lot of things. A man. lot of things. It wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't until I got into the teams and like you start reading intel reports and you're just yeah. like you get it. Well, you get a clearance and then you start reading this stuff and you're just like, dude, if people only this is why we have security clearances and why the general public will not know, mm. cannot know, you know how close, how many close calls there were or how many bad situations could have happened. Mm -hmm. 
You know what I mean? And and I'm glad that I don't have my security clearance now because I got a wife and four kids. Mm. And so I hate to have to think about like things that were just barely averted by, mm. you know, people in my former job yeah. or people in, you know, at the agency or FBI or, you know, yeah. the other special operations yeah. branches. But it's nuts out there, yeah. bro. What can you give us any examples of things that were closely averted that people don't no, even think about? No, I mean, you can't speak just, on just that bad. Kind of just, thing. just, I mean, just use your imagination. Yeah, you know what I mean. Use yeah. your imagination as you know, as I mean, nine eleven is an example. You know what mm. I mean? Like, there's been um, other other situations, situations that close. There's been other situations that could have happened if there weren't people who did the job that we did. I'll just put it, put it, wow. put it like that. Wow. You know what I mean? That's and crazy. So. Um, yeah, and the cool thing about it is, you know, I know we're fast, so there's a lot more to the story, but um, with Buds and me getting kicked out and then coming back and, you know, and, and in my return, that's what led me to Christ, essentially. But, uh, you know, I got to live the best of both worlds because I wasn't, I was a corpsman, but I was also a human guy, which stands for human intelligence. So mm -hmm. I went to a bunch of different intelligence schools mm -hmm. and learned how to run sources and do tradecraft and a bunch of other stuff. And the cool thing is I was able to not just read reports but play a role in creating these reports building this intelligence about bad guys and witnessing stuff firsthand and witnessing hey this is not just somebody at the government saying hey go get him because mm -hmm. we're saying he's bad this mm -hmm. is like i'm seeing what this guy is doing mm. i'm getting firsthand accounts of what this person is doing uh, or planning mm -hmm. you know what i mean like i'm hearing what this person is saying they're gonna do you know what i mean so it's so to be able to to have that insight mm -hmm. takes it to a whole nother level as mm -hmm. far as knowing what's going on and what's not going on yeah you know what i mean yeah that's good what do you make of some of the guys that uh some other navy mm -hmm. seals that have blown up on social media yeah specifically david goggins <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. similar intensity yeah. Yeah. that you guys speak with yeah. <laughs> uh what do you make of a of a david goggins and kind of everything he's been able to do because he's one of yeah. the first black navy seals right there's only no, been a handful. i think there's been like i think we're like around I'd be around 60 yeah. since the history of the teams. I think I was like somewhere around the 50th yeah. since the history of the teams. Yeah. He wasn't the first black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, a rare thing. Sure. It is a lot before him. Yeah, man, I mean, I'm, I'm happy for him and other guys who get out there and crush it in other ways, mm -hmm. man, for sure. And that's able to kind of essentially use their platform to to educate and help others, you know what I mean? Motivate, inspire others, show them what they can do. You know, I know that's what David does. I know, you know, other guys like Andy, Sean Ryan, who has a podcast, that's what he's, he's doing, essentially educating the, the public and, and using his background to draw people in so that they can hear stories from different perspectives. And, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, you know, I think that that's what life is about, especially guys like us is about, okay, giving back in some way mm -hmm. you know what i mean and, and and that's why like that was one of the reasons why i wrote transform it wasn't because i wanted i mean kathy lee gifford had to talk me into writing transform because mm -hmm. i explained to her that you know writing a book in our community is taboo and she was like yeah but remy like your story is crazy mm -hmm. africa bronx you know what i mean like mm -hmm. teams like all of this stuff and then like you came to christ and like your story can inspire and help a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. And I know that you're writing from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, it's cool. It's cool because I know, you know, I know that there are team guys that have big platforms that are helping people. They get letters. I mean, I get letters from people like, yo, you saved my life. Mm -hmm. Yo, I get kids messages from kids in the hood. Like, yo, dude, like I never thought that I could get out of the hood, mm -hmm. but you, I get, I just graduated from ranger school. Mm. I never thought I would lead a hood. I mm -hmm. thought I was going to be a drug. I just graduated from ranger school. And if, and I know David gets those messages as well and, and other guys as well. Yeah. And that's what it's about. It's about yeah. utilizing the platform to inspire, motivate, and educate people to get to the next level. Yeah. And so I, I don't really have a problem with yeah. it. You know what yeah, I mean? why, did, why is it taboo to write, write books? Because I've also yeah. heard some of that like critique. Yeah. Well, well, I, went, I told you I went shooting with some Navy SEALs yeah. not too long ago. And yeah. there was kind of some of that like, ah, yeah. you know, uh, you know, you're supposed yeah. to talk about this stuff the way, yeah. you know what I mean? And yeah. even in some, some of your book, like you... You can't talk about yeah. the actual missions you went yeah. on, you know? I think it's because there have been people who have done it in an inappropriate way mm. or wrong way. Mm. You know what I mean? They've done it in a way that was not necessarily to help others, mm -hmm. but to help themselves. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, in that put a bad taste in a lot of guys' mouths. So that way when some now when somebody does write a book, they won't even read the book. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't become a seal in, in the book until like chapter 24 mm. 
and it's a 30 chapter book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like I'm not talking about the teens. I'm yeah. trying to talk about life, my life and and and, and things that happen. And yeah. I think that, you know, when guys have had other guys when seals have heard of or other seals who've told stories but really focused it more on shooting and, and op ops and all of this other mm -hmm. stuff, then they're like, yo, you're exploiting, you're pimping the trident, so mm -hmm. to speak. You know what I mean? And then they put everybody in that same boat. Kind of mm -hmm. like what you were talking about with Sneaker earlier, where you just put everyone in, yeah, yeah. in the same category. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Instead of saying, oh, let me let me check out this person, but yeah. let me hear yeah. what this person has to say on a podcast yeah. so I can get some insight into who they are and what they're talking about in their stories. Just like, yeah. nope, he wrote a book, so he's in the, in the bag. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, yeah. That, 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 that gives some more context. Yeah. Um, w uh, we make a Jocko. I think his stuff oh, he's is awesome. super dope. Oh, he's awesome, motivation. man. As a matter of fact, I'm, gonna be on, I'm doing this podcast next week. Oh, dope, Yeah, man. he's awesome. He's uh, the Jocko is the same dude he was in the team's as he is now. Okay. That's not plays I'll do. He would he put my platoon through land warfare, man, <laughs> uh, during, before we went on our de deployment, and yeah. it was a kick in the nuts. He, he kills half of the platoon, and yeah. not, not really, but like, half of you, you guys are dead. You got it. So now the other half of the platoon has to carry the other half yeah. out. He's well, still in the firefight, still shooting. It's 120 degrees out in island, and and he's like pushing the, every single person from the top to the bottom. Like mm -hmm. the same way he talked to a freaking E6 is the same way he talked to the OIC of the platoon. And it's not to 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 put them down or or, or embarrass them. It's to get the best out of them. Mm -hmm. And that's how Jocko has always been, man. Yeah. He's awesome, man. Yeah, I, Jocko, yeah, I man. think there's something to studying outliers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there's to be a SEAL, I mean, you're talking about the best of the best of the best. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so I think there's an immense value people who are to some degree genetically gifted. Yeah. Some degree the hand of God is yeah. on, such yeah. as in your case. Yeah. Uh the work ethic, the yeah. the mental fortitude, the you know, all those and I think there's a lot of value in studying those guys and the mentality and to seeing like what makes these guys tick yeah. and how can that some of that be extracted to the regular day to day guy. Yeah. You no, know? No, 100%, 100%. So you said, um, so you said you ended up getting kicked out? Yeah. Is that yeah. Right? So I got, so I, so I made it through Hell Week in first phase. After that, that's when I got super prideful because uh, Hell Week is, a, is like the biggest test in Buds. Uh -huh. Most guys who make it through Hell Week pretty much, you know, make it through Buds and become SEALs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I made it through Hell Week, got performance role for swims because I failed my failed my swims in first phase. Um, learn how to swim in the ocean, learn how to swim better in the ocean, class back up with a class, two classes later, was partying, chasing girls in the gas lamp district, just like totally out of control because mm. of all the power that I, I got. I say that in air quotes. I feel like I got mm -hmm. and uh, got to dive phase, fit, failed my first two swims in dive phase because the swims drop, times dropped from 85 minutes in first phase to 80 minutes in dive phase, which is second phase. Mm -hmm. Got to pool week. On the weekends, the instructors would show up and work with guys who struggle with anything. Mm -hmm. I was too busy partying all night and mm. waking up in some girl's <laughs> bed because in your mind you already made I already it. arrived yeah. i already arrived because i made it through the hardest part mm. you know what i mean and so i wasn't i wasn't there to show up at remediation on the weekends which mm. was about you didn't have to show up but i was too i was waking up in some girl's house at like 10 a.m mm. and remediation started at like 8 a.m mm. you know what i mean and uh and so Got to dive phase, failed the dive test four times. Mm. Went to an ARB board, academic review board. And they were like, yo, you pass all of this stuff physically, but you just you failed these mm. swim evolutions and dive evolutions, and you, we got to kick you out of training. And it was humbling. But mm. that was the first time in my adult life I took responsibility for my action. Before that, I was always blaming this person mm. or this situation, this and that. That was the first time I was just like, it's my fault. Mm. It's my fault. And uh, um, went to Camp Pendleton, back to Camp Pendleton. This time I'm in the infantry with 1st Marine Division instead of the hospital. Mm -hmm. That was humbling because mm -hmm. it was like, yo, man, went from like being in Bud SEAL training to being with the grunts. Mm -hmm. Like the grunts, the mm -hmm. first dudes on the front line. Then mm -hmm. that was, bro, that was a, that was humbling. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I still kept my apartment in San Diego in Mission Valley. So I would have to drive from, mm -hmm. I, you know, up the five from Mission yeah. Valley That's a drive to, too. That's to like Camp a 50, Pendleton. 55 minute drive. Yeah, yeah. yeah man. Every day, bro. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, I, I, I started training the very next day after I got kicked out. I started training, uh, working on what I needed to work on. I didn't know if I would get back to Buds or when. I just started putting in the work. And uh, a year and a half, 
yeah, a year and a half after getting to Camp Pendleton and after doing a deployment, I got I went I got back into SEAL training. Mm. And um, wow, but, but but here's the thing: this is kind of where God started setting up for me to come in. Uh, right before I started SEAL training, I met this girl. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was her friend was dating my roommate, and long story short, I fell fell head, head over heels in love with her. Um, and I was willing to do whatever I needed to do to spend time with her, and she would go to church. Mm-hmm. And she actually went to a church called Cornerstone Church down by uh, in San Diego, mm-hmm. right, right yeah, by Fifty Four. Yep. And uh, and was it Cornerstone? Yeah, it was Cornerstone Church. And they were actually meeting in a tent in the time at the mm-hmm. time because their building was in under construction. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember freaking you know going into church service with her and just mocking everything, making. Fun. I was like, man, this is this is fake. Look mm-hmm. at these fools. They're giving away their money. Look at this pastor. He's mm-hmm. a clown. All of this. And uh, as our relationship began to progress, and as I began to progress through SEAL training, you know, starting from the bottom again, mm-hmm. I gradually pulled away from church. Mm. And uh, um, after I, I made it through BUDS, basic underwater demolition SEAL training, I went to jump school, and uh, uh, I broke my leg on my, I broke my ankle on my second jump. Mm. I, you know, long story short, wind hit my parachute the wrong way. It was some miscommunication with the DZ commander and came come came flying towards the ground. And as soon as I hit the ground, I heard my, my medial malleolus, which is the Oof. ankle of stability and your bone split. Ouch. Snap, crackle, and pop. Ugh. And um, you I, knew right away? I knew right away. Ugh. I knew it was broken. I mean, it was done. It was, it was done. And um, I uh, had to make a decision at that point. Do I go to the hospital, not be able to walk for the next couple of however months, recover, start static line jump again and break it again? Mm-hmm. Or do I just do my last two jumps? Because static, let's say there's two types of jumping in special operations. There's static line where mm-hmm. you jump out of the plane. As soon as you jump out of the plane, your parachute opens. Mm-hmm. The line pulls your parachute open, mm-hmm. but there's no real control of your canopy. So you have to do what's called a PLF, a uh, parachute landing fall, mm. so that that way you can control your fall so you don't break anything. <laughs> like that's how archaic. Gosh, that's how man. archaic you know static line is. Yeah. Uh, it was. It was. It was. I think it started back in World War II to yeah. to get a bunch of guys out of the get plane out, at the yeah. same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's free fall. Whereas free fall, you jump out of the plane, free fall through the air, pull your parachute, and you know when you're ready. And then, you, and then your, your canopy, you can like you can literally come down on your toes mm. because turn, you, you know, broke your ankle on the static line. On the static line because it didn't because did, there was no control, and then the wind hit the parachute the wrong way. And sheesh, uh, man. And so anyway, I, I, I made a decision that I was going to do my next two jumps because I, I didn't want to start. Well, hold on, with a broken ankle. Broken ankle. Broke well, hold ankle. on, hold on. How are you even able to get up and move around? I, I figured it out, bro. Like I got what? up, and so I, I remember getting up, and as I was walking, I collapsed because uh, the bone would slip, and then I was oh, just falling. Oh lord, yeah, man, it was brutal. And then um, I got to, because so many guys get injured on static yeah. line jumps, yeah. Yeah. when you check in, you have to check in with a medic uh. because they know guys get, and they the medic kind of looks you up and down. And so she saw me limping and she was like, what's wrong with you? And being a corpsman, I was like, I sprained my left ankle, even uh. though it was my right ankle that was broken. Uh. And so she was like, all right, let me see your, your ankle. Oh. So I took off my boot and it was like, she was like, oh, there's some little swell in there, but I think you're fine. If she was a good medic, she would have had me take off both boots and mm. compare it, but she wasn't. Mm. And so um There you go, finesse and assist. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so I got a all after all the other guys landed, we all loaded up on a bus and I told my guys, I was like, yo, boys, I said, dude, my I'm done, bro. My ankle's broken, smash. Yeah. And it was like, dang. And they were like, all right, we'll help you do what you want to do. And I was like, dude, I want to do these last two jumps. Cause we had two more jumps two, that day. Two. And I was like, because all you had to do get was four, and then you get your qual. Yeah. And so I was like, let's just do these last two jumps. And he was like, all right, we'll protect you. Yeah. We get back to the uh, hangar yeah. to repack our parachutes and get ready for a second jump. And the instructors call it. They're like, yo, the winds are too high. Uh-huh. It was like, we can't do any more jumping for the rest of the day because the winds, which played a role in yep. my parachute kind of burning in, yep. they were like violently high. So our Sheesh. jump was the last jump yeah. of that day. Yeah. And so. I was like, crap. And all the guys looked at me like, dang, dude, this dude has to freak <laughs> go back. So I got I got home. Uh, you know, like as soon as I crossed my threshold, I collapsed on the floor. I had to crawl everywhere. Um, I like tried to lay on my I couldn't lay on I couldn't lay in bed. Like, mm. cause I would lay on my side and my the bone and 
skin, everything would call them oh. like this. Then my other side, other thing, you know, even when I laid on my back, it was just like like my foot would come down because it was broken. Oh my gosh. And so I got out of bed, crawled into the living room, sat on a couch. And literally I just sat on a couch and just had my foot like this, like yeah. pushed down together to try and push the bones together. Yeah. And uh, that was how I fell asleep. The next morning, a buddy of mine came, spat it. He played uh, football at SDSU, so yeah. he spat it up my ankle. And uh, and then I went in. And when I when I, when I when, <laughs> oh my god yeah it was crazy. When I got back in, <laughs> he just ta he just taped you up. He just taped me up. This man said yeah. we gonna put some duct tape yeah. on yeah. it <laughs> and, and an ankle brace. Yeah. Not even an ankle brace. <laughs> so here's the crazy thing: like we get back to the hangar the next day, and they had us do PLF practices uh -huh. because, again, they know people get injured on right. these type of jumps, so right. they want to make sure nobody's hiding anything. Wow. So PLF practices, it's like steps. It's like you walk up steps, and the top the top uh, box is like maybe maybe it's, either, it's like the size of that table right mm -hmm. there, that black table. It's uh -huh. like that. And then you got to jump off. Oh, yeah. my gosh. And so, like, and so, I, so it was my turn. And all my guys were like, yo, they were like, dude, Remy, you going to go through with this? You sure? I was like, yep. Jumped off, like, tried to favor my left ankle a bit. And as soon as I hit the ground, my ankle smooth shifted oh. everywhere. And the instructor was like, you didn't peel off right. Do it again. Oh, my gosh. Do it again. Jumped again. Do it again. Jumped again. Finally, like, the fourth or fifth time. And all my guys knew that it was broken. The fourth or fifth time, the medic runs up. She had just arrived. She came late. She was like, what are you doing? Stop making him do the PLF. He sprained his left ankle. Like, give him a break. Yeah. It's not PLF and right because he sprained his yeah. left ankle. Wow. And that's how I was able to pass. Wow. So then I did my, you know, I did my second jump. I did my third jump. Painful. Yeah. Did my fourth jump. Painful. And then, like, started limping in and... The, not the medic, but the DZ commander was like, why are you walking? You should be running. And I screamed, I cursed him. I was like, because I effing broke my freaking leg. Mm. I need to go to the hospital. Yeah. He was like, oh, I went to the hospital, couldn't walk for four months. But I tell that story because it was in that four months that my girlfriend, that girl, yeah. showed me the love of God. Okay, so was oh, before we get into yeah. that, 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 was that the last thing where you're like officially? Well, you get your rating as a SEAL once you graduate BUDS. Okay. So I got my SEAL rating. I had already graduated, but so okay. I got my SEAL rating, so I got rated as an SO. Okay. So, so what is this that you're doing this now? Is, it's like SQT, so SEAL qualification training. You okay. just do some, like, uh, you get treated as a SEAL. Uh -huh. You just do, like, these these training segments yeah. to get your trident and go okay. to a team. Okay. Right? And so once you once you finish that, then not only could you go to a team, but you're eligible to actually deploy as a SEAL. Got it. Okay. And some guys, once they finish SQT, they actually meet their, their platoon in whatever country they're in and, oh, wow. and, and, and go on deployment. This is the last part of the whole process before yeah. you go deploy with before a team. You, before you, yeah, essentially, okay. yeah, before you, so that you could add, so it qualifies you to actually operate as a Navy SEAL. Gotcha. So, but you're, you're again, you're, I know it's confusing, you're treated as a SEAL after BUDS, you yeah. get the rating as a SEAL of uh -huh. a SEAL, uh -huh. but you can't operate until you get these specific quals. Gotcha, okay. So then in the in the hospital, you're laid up for four months, you said? Yeah, well, I was in the hospital. I was I couldn't walk for four months. Couldn't walk for four I months. I couldn't walk. Okay. I went to the hospital and I couldn't walk for four months. I was on crutches of cast. They were gonna do surgery, but then they decided not to. They ended up getting a bone simulator, which was this device that I would have to wrap around my, it was like a box that I would have to kind of like put around my ankle like twice a day and it would send these, these magnetic waves through my bone to try and instigate uh, fusion of the bone back together. Mm -hmm. And it was painful, dude. It mm -hmm. sucked. Um, and in that four months, this girl showed me the love of God. She mm -hmm. would like, she would bring me food. She would leave her dog with me to like keep me company throughout the day. She would, she would cook for me. She mm -hmm. would like, you know, help me to the bathroom. I mean, she did everything for me. And I was, uh, you know, I was such an angry person. I was angry. I was, Hateful. I mean, you name. I was mad at the world. I was mm. just at everything that had happened to me and everything. And I would pour out all of my anger on her. Mm. But she would still keep showing up day mm. after day after day. Mm. And once I was able to walk, I broke up with her. Mm. And I'll never forget, you know, she came to my apartment because I, I was cheating on her too. She came to my apartment and she was, and, and I essentially told her, I was like, yo, listen, I'm done. She's mm. like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm done. I don't want to be with you anymore. And she put her back against the wall and slid down and just was crying and sobbing. Mm. And she was just like, how could you do this to me? Like, mm. I've given up everything for you. Like, and I was like, get out of my apartment. Jeez. And uh, um, like, so, so crazy. June of 2008, 
just like June of 2002, mm-hmm. I was in my bed, laying there, just got back from night of hooking up with some girls or mm-hmm. some girl, whatever, and uh, I heard this voice speak to me mm. and say, take her back. Mm. The same night, the same the same date. The, the June, not the same date, but, but the, the same, same month. month. The wow. same month. Take her back. Mm. And I propped my head up, looked around. Nobody was there. Mm. What was on my desk, I had tickets to a Roots concert mm. that was going to be at uh, Shelter Island. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was going to take this other girl. Mm-hmm. And I was like, damn, I'm supposed to take this other girl. Mm-hmm. And I called up my ex, and I was like, yo, you know, begrudgingly, I'm like, yo, I got these tickets. You want to go? And she was so excited to hear from mm. me. And she was like, all right, I'll go with you. And uh, so we went, and then we got back into her. And then my mom had also called me as well, and she was just like, yo, what are you doing, Remy? I didn't, I didn't raise you to treat women like this. She's a good woman. She loves you. Mm. Stay with her. Stop being dumb. Mm-hmm. And uh, between that, we got back into a relationship. I'm still cheating on her, still being rude. And then I got sent. I get sent to cold weather survival training in Alaska. Mm-hmm. And uh, and while I'm out there, I had to do these land navigations where I would navigate from like one end of this Alaskan island to the other end of this Alaskan island, and it would be by myself. Like they would give us all points mm-hmm. where we wouldn't be able to interact with each other. We wouldn't even see each other. And so like. I just remember walking through the wilderness and just being in awe of like nature and beauty. Mm. And it was in that time that it was as though somebody held up a mirror. Mm. And so as I'm walking through the middle of the wilderness, I'm reflecting, I'm seeing how I treated my girlfriend. I'm seeing how I treated my mom and brother. I'm seeing how I treated people and women and all this other stuff. And no lie, like I started feeling disgusted. Mm. It was like I was saying to my I did that to her. I did mm. this to my brother. I did mm. like no, I couldn't like I couldn't believe it. Mm. And uh, uh, you know, as soon it was it was walking through that wilderness, through that nature, and seeing God's creation that I made the decision. I was like, you know what? When I get back from Alaska, I'm gonna propose to her. I'm gonna marry her. I'm gonna stop cheating. I'm gonna stop being a, a dirt bag. I'm gonna stop being a mean, evil person. I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna stop. I made that decision. Mm-hmm. Unbeknownst to me, around that that same week that I'm like off in the Alaskan wilderness. She goes to a party. She meets a woman. Well, she runs into a woman who she used to work with Mm -hmm. years earlier. Mm -hmm. And this woman is married to a seal. Mm -hmm. And the woman goes up to her and she's like, yo, I heard that you're dating a seal. And she's like, yeah, yeah, I am. She's like, how's it going? She's like, it's going all right. And the woman says to her, listen, I'm married to a seal. It's hard to be married to those guys. If it's going all right now, it's going to get worse. Mm -hmm. So if I were you, I would leave them. Mm -hmm. Jeez. And, uh... And she was like, it was that conversation that gave her the strength to leave me. Now, I didn't know this was happening, right? Mm -hmm. So flat, jump back to cut back to Alaska. I get a break out of the wilderness, right? So I'm still in Alaska, but I go to a barracks, right? And in this barracks, you know, we're all kind of living in this room, but downstairs, you know, we're living in this big open room on the second floor, but downstairs there's like offices, pool table, and a phone. There's only one phone because you don't get no cell phone Mm -hmm. reception out there. And And I remember coming out of the wilderness the first day and I picked up the phone and I called her up and I was like, yo, don't say anything. Like, I know I've been mean to you. I know I've been crazy. When I get back, I want to marry you. I'm going to turn my life around. Like, I don't want to be the person I used to be. And yeah, and and and, and she was dead silent on the phone. Mm. And I was like, dude, what's going on? This is one of the new pieces from the He Is Him collection, Jesus the King. When you wear this shirt, you do two things. One, you remind yourself in your life who the king is when you put this thing on. Two, you represent who the king is when you go out in public. So get ready for the He Is Him collection available this Friday to Sunday only. <laughs> you like, had, I thought this had what party. you wanted. Yeah. <laughs> I was, and, uh, and, she, and I was like, what's going on? She was like, uh... I was gonna wait to tell you wait until I get back to tell you. I was like, tell me what you sick? Like the thought of her leaving me had never crossed because I had done some horrible stuff to her and she never left me. Mm. So I was like, this chick ain't gonna leave me. So the, so I was so deceived into believing that she wouldn't leave, leave me that I thought that she had cancer or something. Mm. I was like, Are you sick? You got cancer? What's going on? Tell me, tell me. And then finally she was like, I'm done. Mm. Like, then what? I'm leaving you. Mm. I was like, why? She was like, because you're horrible to me. I don't mm-hmm. want to be with a seal, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. I was like, yeah, but you don't get it. Like, I know. I made this decision before. <laughs> like, uh, you know, how'd you yeah. She was like, it's too late. Uh, and then she hung up on me. 
And bro, like I felt like I was in a twilight zone, like literally Sheesh. like, dude, I was just like a mess. And my brother had told me when I was a kid, well not, well, not a kid, but he had always told me when we were teens, late teens, even my early twenties, you know, he would say, cause he became a Christian in college. He would say, yo, Remy, when, not if, but when you hit rock bottom, just remember to cry out to Jesus. Mm. Just remember to cry out to Jesus. And so like, I just remember feeling so like much anguish in my mm. spirit. Uh, there's a scripture in Proverbs that says, uh, the human spirit can endure a sick body, but who can bear a crushed spirit? Mm -hmm. I never understood. Like I, re I didn't understand what I was going through then, but years later when I came across that scripture in Proverbs, I was like, yes, this is exactly what happened to me. My mm. spirit was crushed. Mm. And uh, I just remember going into my back to my room and just saying, Jesus, help me. Mm. And then, dude, I was getting attacked spiritually. And I think the enemy was attacking me spiritually because he knew how so loud I was for him. Mm. So he knew that if this guy mm -hmm. follows his brother's direction, he's going to become a, he's going to, you know, follow Jesus. Yeah. And that dude's going to be, he's going to give me hell. You know what I mean? And so, uh, I was literally hearing voices tormenting me, telling mm. me I need to kill my, like, it was crazy. Mm. And then, like, I had to go back out and do these land navigations, mm. and it was just, again, I was feeling this bombardment. I'm cold, I'm wet, I'm miserable. Mm -hmm. And and literally, I just started saying, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me. When I got back from Alaska, she came to my apartment and to pick up her stuff, and I thought that if she saw me in person, like, her perspective would sure. change a little bit, but it didn't. Mm. And I just remember just, just breaking down after she left. And then I called her that night and I was just like, listen, I need you to take me back because I'm just in a really bad spot. She was like, I'm not taking you back. Mm. And then finally I said, all right, if you're not gonna take me back, the words just came out of me, can you take me to church? Mm. And she was like, all right, I won't take you back, but I'll take you to church. Mm. And the next day, dude, you know, she, Cornerstone Church, October 5th, 2008. Mm. She took me to church. I can't tell you anything the pastor preached, but I can tell you that I was so broken and so in desperate need of, of something bigger than me to help overwhelm what was overwhelming me that I was just like, yo, mm. have it, Lord. Like, mm. if you're real, take away this pain, help me, and I surrender my life. Mm. And uh, everything changed from there, man. Like, I didn't get her back, but you know what I mean? Like, dude, I, cold turkey stops, like, which was crazy because mm. I was either watching pornography or sleeping with chicks. Mm. Like literally, I had one time after that happened with this girl and I just felt like mm -hmm. this sickness, mm -hmm. like like this grievance in yep. my system. And yep. I was like, man, like this, this isn't right. And right. bro, cold turkey. Wow. No, no pornography, stop partying, stop cussing. Like everything just changed, yeah. dude. Yeah, Radi and radical. Radical conversion. transformation, yeah. dude. And yeah. I remember guys were like, yo, What's going on, Remy? Like, yeah. this ain't you. What's going on? I was like, yo, man, I, I had an encounter with Christ, bro. And mm -hmm. I was like, yo, like, I, I can't explain it, but I ain't trying to live the way I used to live anymore, man. I, I feel better now. Mm -hmm. And that, and that was how it all came together, man. Wow. Yeah, man. That's amazing, bro. Yeah, yeah. Um, So what was that? That process, you stayed in the, in as a CO for a while? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. So I saw you, I saw, you know, I, Stayed in the team, and what was that like? Because, because I, I, you know, I, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know a lot of seals, but yeah. it doesn't seem like there's a lot of like overtly born yeah. again seals. Yeah, in that, I in mean, because there's, yeah. there's, there's an aspect of you where it hardens you. You know what nah, I mean? Yes and no. I mean, there. Interestingly, a lot of guys in the teams are either Christian. The interest is super interesting. Either Christians or come from Christian families. Right. I figured the Christian families part. But yeah, but there's a lot of guys who could tell you everything about the Bible. Hey, my dad's a pastor. Uh -huh. It's just the in most interesting thing. But you do get a lot of Christians in the team. Interesting. Okay. A lot of Christians. So, so so it was a seamless transition then. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't I mean, that hard. Not, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, um, the big thing that I learned in the community is that like you will be you won't you will be respected as a team guy mm -hmm. and, and, and Christian. If you really live it, mm, okay. But if you don't, or if you're like a, if you're like a dude that's going around like this, there was a guy I won't mention his name going, "You going to hell if you're going to strip club? You're going to hell by not doing mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. You need to stop. You need to repent and turn from mm -hmm. your ways." Mm -hmm. Yeah, hard. Uh, them, that those guys get the worst treatment in, in the in the community. At gotcha. the end of the day, one thing I loved about the teams is that it's all performance based. Mm. If you're a great operator and a great teammate yeah. and not imposing like your will or your faith on other people, yeah. people will love you. Mm. If you suck as an operator and you're a Christian, 
like you're going to be tormented. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, if, mm -hmm. if you suck as an operator and you're not a Christian, you're going to get hammered. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's all performance-based, but there was no, like, when guys wanted to go to the strip club as a new guy, all right, let's go. Mm. Like, I, I wasn't going to be like, hey, you're going to hell if you go to the strip club. And I was like, nope, all right. Drive him to the strip club, sit in the car, because I, I was a new guy, <laughs> you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it was like, I had to do my new guy duties, you know what I mean? And I sit in the car. As soon as the guys come out the strip club, I'm there waiting, driving back, not judging them, not saying anything, mm. not condemning them, none of that stuff. Just all right, let's go. Yeah, you know what I mean. And uh, and I didn't, I didn't have any problems mm. in in uh, that's awesome in, in my community. The crazy thing is, here's another crazy thing is, this is a crazy God story. But that 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 woman, I met her years later. The woman who spoke to my girlfriend mm -hmm. at that party, mm -hmm. her husband ended up becoming my platoon chief. Oh, what a trip. Later. Wow! And one day I'm at this bar. We're, we're we're like we're at a platoon barbecue because uh -huh. we had crushed our workup cycle. We just came from doing training with Jocko actually uh -huh. and crushed it. And uh, we're having a platoon barbecue on the beach. And uh, this car pull. And my chief's already there. And this car pulls up, and this is woman in the car. And she's just like she won't get out the car. Mm -hmm. And so my chief goes up to her and walks up to the car. And he's like, "Why don't you get out the car? Get out the car." And she's like, "I don't want to get out right now." Mm -hmm. And then like. He looks over at one point and she's like staring at me. Mm -hmm. And he looks at me, he's like, dude, why is my wife staring at you? Why is my wife staring at you? <laughs> and then like finally she gets up the car and she beelines straight to me. And she's like, I know who you are. And my whole platoon like looks at me like, what the heck? Yeah. Like, how do you know Chief's wife? Yeah. And she's like, so and so loved you and this and yeah. that and this. And then she was like, and I spoke to her. Yeah. And I was like, You put it all together. That was the one. Yeah. Put it all together. And, and that platoon chief was the one who you know, who um, right before we were going to deploy was like, yo, listen, we're going to be on a self-sustaining base. Yep. We're not going to have, which is a fob forward operating base. We're not going to have cooks. We're not going to have, we're going to be in the middle of nowhere operating out of this this place. He was like, uh, he was like, well, do you want to be the lay leader mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, conduct church service and Bible studies? Mm -hmm. So we weren't on missions on Sunday. I was conducting church service. We were on mission on Wednesday. I was doing Bible studies. That's dope. And he was the one that kind of got me started in ministry. Mm -hmm. So it was like, she led to yeah, me, yeah. her letting me go in this crisis. Wow. Was, what a trip, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how much longer did you stay as a, in the uh, eight Navy? Eight years. Eight years? Oh, so, so I did 13 years total, but eight years in the, in the team. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then when did you retire? I got. I didn't retire. I just got out after in 2016. 2016. Yeah. So I, my my first son was born in uh, 2014. My second son was born in 2015. And then like 2016, I had to make a decision: do I, you know, do I go back and deploy and do work up and all of that, or do I get out? And so I decided. I was like, you know what? My dad died when I was five. Mm. I want to be home with my kids. There you go. You know, let me get out. Yeah. And yeah. the and. You, what was the transition like? Because now you're doing stuff in Hollywood. Yeah. Was that fairly seamless, or was there kind of yeah. some transitionary phase? No, nah, you know, honestly, I wasn't even trying to get into Hollywood when I, like, like before I got out, I got my bachelor's, you know, used the military benefits to get my bachelor's, and then um, I started my master's before I got out as well. Mm -hmm. And so my brother-in-law, he's a multimillionaire, He's a YPO, or mm -hmm. stands for Young Presidents Organization, or there's chapters all across the world in order to get in. You have to be a millionaire, a billionaire under the age of 40 to get in a Young Presidents Organization. And so he started getting me these consulting gigs with his company and his buddies' companies from different YPOs and stuff like that. So my plan when I got out was to go into business consulting, essentially mm -hmm. taking special operations principles like teamwork, communication, sure. all that stuff, and translating them in a way that applies to business. Oh, that's dope. And so... So, but I didn't want to just be the Navy SEAL. I wanted to have some educational backing as well. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was getting my master's in organizational strategy. Got it. So, you know, when I got out, I was I was in grad school and that was January 2016. And then, you know, I had I had a good savings. So my wife's a doctor. She was in, I want to say she was either in residency or the end of residency, or maybe she had just started her career as a doctor. And so we had some good coin there. And then I had the post 9-11 GI Bill that was sent, giving me money every month as long as I was in school. Mm -hmm. So I didn't need to work. And so um, fast forward to May of 2016, I'm in my office writing papers. And this lady reaches out to me. And she's like, hey, you know, uh, Michael Bay's looking for former SEAL with your background to work on Transformers the last night. Are you available tomorrow? And I was like, 
yeah, I mean, I ain't got Jeez. nothing going on. I'm Come writing on, papers man. for school. Yeah. And so uh, she was like, all right, send me some pictures. So I sent him some pictures. She was like, all right, Bay approved you. Come tomorrow to set. Gave me the address and everything. Next day, I'm on set in L.A. Wow. Uh, and the, this well, it wasn't, it was outside of L.A., this desert. Mm -hmm. And so that one day turned into three weeks. Mm -hmm. This Bay brought me back. It was like, yo, I like working with this dude. Let's bring him back for three weeks. So I did a week in Arizona, two weeks in Michigan. At the end of the third week, the casting um, the lady approached me. was like, yo, Bay wants to keep you on until we wrap. Mm. Can you stay on it? So I stayed on the film until... December. So that was my first project. And that was kind of how I got into business. And you were a consultant on that or an actor? I was a consultant slash actor. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so like bro. like folks see the movie, they'll see you in it? Yeah, yeah 100 percent 100 percent I got lines in it and everything. Really? Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. dope, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, man, that was kind of how and then once you work on a project like that and people hear your name, then you know, there's always directors and producers who yeah. are looking for like somebody with your experience to come consult on a project. Maybe another guy's not available. Can you come do and so I just started that's how my career started progressing and mm. I started consulting and then um more and acting more did another film with Bay and started working in uh, volunteering different with different human trafficking nonprofits at the same time mm -hmm. and then you know and and yeah man and then before I know I was like you know what I need to teach myself screenwriting because mm -hmm. I would get before I would get asked to work on a well before I would start working on a project I would get the sent, sent the screenplay mm -hmm. so I would read these screenplays and I'm like dude I I really feel like I could write better than this. Mm -hmm. I had already written, written Transform. My, gotcha. My, my books, I was just like, let me take a crack at screenwriting. Mm -hmm. So I got the master class and did Aaron Sorkin's master class and, and Shonda Rhimes and a bunch of other people. And then I freaking started watching, subscribing to YouTube channels mm -hmm. on screenwriting and storytelling mm -hmm. and start, that's how and I wrote my first screenplay and then wrote another screenplay. And then, you know, one of my screenplays got optioned and I wrote another, then I got hired to write another screenplay where it got me into the WGA and then like, and I was like, all right, I want to be a writer. I want to be a director because I wrote a screenplay that got optioned by a major producer, but it was hard to get a director attached because, you know, there's only but so many directors that Hollywood will trust with an $80 million budget. And uh, and 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 th there's so many projects that sure. people are trying to get made. So I was just like, you know what, screw it. I'm going to teach myself how to direct. So mm. I directed my first short film, The Unexpected organ harvesting film. I wanted to focus on because, I, again, I was volunteering with different human trafficking nonprofits and then that film got picked up to be a feature film and then you know, other stuff started happening. So it was a progression. It started out as a consultant slash actor, then then became a writer and then slash producer and then progressed to now being a writer, director, and producer. That's incredible. Yeah. So a lot of Christians are going to hear this and instantly yeah. go, yeah. Uh, Christians yeah. in Hollywood, yeah. Ooh, yeah. The, the Illuminati, the, yeah. the, the, the blood rituals, yeah. all this stuff, right? Yeah. Um, how are you able to navigate that terrain? I mean, I'm not yeah. obviously some of the conspiratorial yeah. stuff that yeah. people say, but yeah. how are you able to navigate that terrain as a Christian who's unapologetic about his faith yeah, you know, in these spaces? Yeah, I, one, I don't experience all that stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. all the I, I've never seen or heard of rituals, or I've never seen blood rituals or any of this crazy stuff. Um, that people throw out there uh, as far, like, I just do my job, man. Yeah. I just look at it like a job, like anything else. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like, I show up, I do my job with excellence, I go home. Mm. Like, I don't I don't live in L.A. Mm -hmm. I, live, I live in San Diego. I don't do the party thing. You think they'll invite you to the rituals if you lived in L.A.? Uh, I, I, don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm joking. Yeah, I, maybe, but uh, but you're yeah. not in the mix yeah, enough. We yeah. got to be more in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I don't know. I just know that like I'm about my business. Yeah, and then I'm about storytelling and using story to impact people. Yeah, and so like I don't I don't hang around. Yeah, you know, like, even when I'm one like most of the projects that I've worked on don't film in L. A. Anyway, mm. like I filmed in. In Italy, mm -hmm. you know, I filmed in Abu Dhabi, I filmed mm -hmm. in Morocco, I filmed in Puerto Rico, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, so a lot of the projects I work on don't even film. And even when I'm out there, you know what I mean? It's like I go to set, do my job, come back to my hotel and and and, and work or face yeah. out with my family. Yeah. So like that's essentially how I navigate it. Yeah. I just You just mind my, your business. I just mind my business. Mind you know your what business. I'm saying? And do my job and and you know, and 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 don't judge and you know what I mean? And and you know, and and that's it. You yeah. know, and I think there's a, uh, a, an opportunity for Christians to recapture narrative and story yeah, yeah, 100%. as a way to help articulate the gospel, whether yeah. overtly through yeah. uh, things like Jesus Revolution yeah. and The Chosen, yeah. or maybe not as overtly through yeah. just testimony and story. Yeah. Uh, and I think we've done ourselves a disservice by fleeing media, by moving away from entertainment, yeah. by being afraid— 
of these things, you know? Or even worse, by cheesing it up, mm. by creating content that is not palatable to a wide audience. Mm -hmm. It's only palatable to a certain group That's of good. audiences. Yeah. That's why, like, that was one of my fights with my publisher for Transform. Mm -hmm. It was like, they were like, well, we don't want the cursing in there. We don't want, mm -hmm. we don't want the crazy stuff you did in there. We want, and I was like, yo, but listen, I was like, it's called Transformed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, how can there be a they, transformation? They got to read the book to get the whole transformation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how can they get, be transformed if I'm watering down who I was yep, yep. for a small group of people? Yep. You know, when I say I don't, I say, when I say I don't mean like it's, I mean like a, a buyers mm -hmm. for this book. Like mm -hmm. I'm trying to buy, I'm trying to write this book for everybody, yeah, right? Yeah. And so I think that you know that's that's been an issue in Hollywood, dudes. I'm beyond all honesty, the worst business situations I've had in Hollywood have been with Christians. Really, hundred percent. Tell me more. Tell me why. Well, you know. You get people that are like, yo, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, let's do this. Mm. And either A, they're manipulative, mm. they use it as a uh, as a uh, uh as a ticket to try to get in, or B, they suck at what <laughs> they do. <laughs> We're going to title this, we're going to title this yeah. clip The Dark Side of Christians in Hollywood. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they suck at what they do. Man. They don't perform with excellence. Yikes. They, they you know, they, oh, we're just going to pray that everything, and God's going, it's like, no, man, you got to put in the work. You got to put in the effort. You mm -hmm. got to write a good script. You got to tell a good story. You got to get good lenses. You got to get, like, it's not like, they're always trying to cut corners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know what I mean? And going back to, again, I think what's helped me in Hollywood is, dude, the teams. I just follow. Do show up on time. Do your job with excellence. Don't be judging people. You know mm -hmm. what I mean. You know what I mean. And 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 just and 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 things work. And dude, I get guys to this day, mm -hmm. dudes to this day who I serve with, they call me, yo, Remy, like, can I come to church with you? Mm -hmm. Or yo, can you pray for me? Mm -hmm. These are guys who like didn't want to have nothing to do with God, mm -hmm. you at all. Like, yo, can you pray with me? Yeah. You know? And guys who like, I never thought that they would like come to the Lord and like I see him on social media now and they're like mm. loving Jesus. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And these are guys that, and, and they tell me, they was like, I had a guy reach out, message me uh, one time. He's like, yo dude, he was like, I treated you like he, he didn't treat me bad, but he was like, yo, I made fun of you behind your back sometimes because mm. you were Christian mm. and like, you know, and, and this and that. And I know I was rude, at, rude, to, not rude to you, but like I would curse around you and do all of these things. You know what I mean? Like to try and like, tempt you but mm -hmm. he's like dude i want you to know that like i became a christian mm, that's and he's dope. like and he's like and the only and one of the only reasons why is because i reflected on how you would walk mm. and how much peace you always had yeah and i was in a really really dark place and i just wanted that and what what was brought to my memory was the way you lived your life that's good like the way you lived your life preached yeah. to me yeah you know what i mean you never judged me you never mm -hmm. got in my face you never told me i'm going to hell or any of that stuff you yeah. just love me yeah and he's like now i want to you know walk with the lord and that's so dope. i mean and, i think i think it's like being in the world but not of the world exactly you know what exactly I mean? and i think a lot of christians have really they i don't know they did they, they've just messed up the way to do ministry and like i said it all comes back to in my opinion first and foremost the first way you preach anybody is the way you live your life, and it's not just oh, I'm not gonna drink. It's like no, I'm gonna I'm gonna do what I do with excellence. Yeah, and when I do what I do with excellence, that's gonna draw people are attracted to that. Yeah, you know what I mean. And so I say all I have to say. It's just, it's just, that's the I follow that template in the teams. Yep. And I saw how guys who didn't follow that template in the teams were like the worst teammates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I try to follow that template in Hollywood. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. Show up on time, do my job with excellence. Don't judge anybody. Yeah you know preach by the way i live my life mm -hmm. and things will work out and I, I i feel like that's why i haven't really had any problems yeah. you know what i mean yeah because of that yeah that's dope I, I i think the the beautiful part about that is is that there's a become a relational evangelism yeah. to it yeah. and i think the tricky part can be if people ask we're supposed to tell them the truth yeah the issue is Sometimes people won't ask, yeah, 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 yeah. nor do we have enough relational equity and trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we'll offer up opinions that people didn't ask exactly. for, or yeah. give them too much truth than they're ready to exactly. handle. You yeah. know, so I think it's like this this tension that we have to live in of let me let me love you and accept you as you are, yeah. 
you know, and then over time we build the the the, the relational aspect. Yeah, yeah. And then if you ask me, we might talk about it, yeah, you know, yeah, or if we have enough relationship with everyone, where I think oftentimes Christians want to, we're like socially, socially stunted. Yeah. We don't pick up on any of the basic social cues, tact, yep. relationship, yep. trust. And so we'll just go in yep. with this very uh, used car yeah. salesman yep. sales and the judgment kind of comes out of that. Exactly. Because if, 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 if I'm, if I am convinced that you're going to hell, I should want to tell you about Jesus. Yeah. But how I do that yeah, yeah, yeah. is super duper important. 100%. And if I also don't believe that God is ultimately providential and sovereign and yeah. can do what he wants and moves how he wants yeah. and might have me in people's lives for seasons yeah. and not for, I got this one shot to be in front of this yeah, one yeah, guy. Yeah. I got to make sure I tell him. Yeah, every, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, it's almost out of this over, uh, this insecurity and overcompensation, yeah, yeah. it seems 100%. like what you're describing. No, 100%. Yeah, yeah, dude, cr I got a crazy story, man. Like, there was this girl. Drop dead gorgeous actress, gorgeous actress from another country. You know what I mean? So she had this accent. She's like six foot, maybe yeah, six foot tall, just gorgeous. And I met her and we became cool friends. Mm -hmm. And she didn't know I was married because when I'm acting and doing certain things, it's just a habit from the community. Like when you operate, you don't wear a wedding ring, mm -hmm. right? And so, like, one day, like, we had a break from working on something we were working on. And she was like, oh, no, no, no. I remember what happened. I was do I was working on this scene. And in this scene, like, I was improv you know, a, a, it was like a relational relationship type thing. And so I was pulling from my past experience when I was a player because I was lying to this girl in the scene. And so after the scene, she was like, like, how did you, like, where did you pull that from? And I was like, oh, I was like, you know, I used to be crazy sleeping around doing all this other stuff and that is but you know now you know you know i'm, I'm married and you know and I'm, i didn't even say I, no i don't even say i was married i can't remember how though because mary came out later and she's like really she was like can you help me understand that like i have all of these guys that cheat on me and this and like in my mind i'm like cheat on you <laughs> like because she's like drop dead gorgeous and, and 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 she was like i'd like to get to know you better and i said i was like yeah, i know but i'm married mm -hmm. she's like oh i'm so sorry i'm so mm -hmm. sorry i'm so sorry so like literally we just kept we became we stayed friends became cool and then one when my book came out i sent her a copy of my book mm -hmm. and she read it and you know still out there she was doing all kinds of crazy ayahuasca and all kinds of stuff like she would have rich dudes flying all over the world to you know mm -hmm. do all kinds of dude like no lie two years ago um in i'm in boston about to fly to abu dhabi to work on a project maybe three years ago and she calls me up and she's cry crying hysterically. And she's like, Remy, she was like, I'm in Germany right now. And I'm in this five star restaurant or whatever, a seven star restaurant in the toilet. And I'm just, I can't control myself because I'm finally believing and thinking that Jesus is real. Wow. wow. <laughs> and she's like, I don't know who to call. I don't know who to talk to. Like, please tell me he's not real. Yeah. She's like, please tell me that, like, I can live however I want to mm. live and everything. She's like, and she's crying. I was like, nah, I was like, Jesus is real. I was mm. like, he loves you. Like, he has a plan for you. And she was like, I know. She's like, I know this is truth, but something wants to pull me back. She's like, because I read your book. Mm. And she's like, your book spoke to me so mm. much and showed me that I could be there. Dude, she is, dude, she is still an actress, mm -hmm. but she also, like, does prostitute in the street out. Mm. And he prostitutes listen to her because she's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. So they go so she's to, able to go so into she, these, and, yeah. and she's an actress, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And you know what I mean? And so she's like, right, but I say all that to say, like, I didn't, it's just all about being in tune with the, with the Holy spirit and mm -hmm. being in tune with the tools that he gives you. Like you said, like, you know, not being a used car salesman, you know what I mean? Just being like, yeah. just waiting for the opportunities yep. and the opportunities to come. And the tool may be like, yo, I'm gonna just give this person a book. Yep. The tool may, the tool may be like, Yo, I'm gonna just be here to listen when you got every time you have a bad something bad come yeah. that happens to you. Yeah. Not listen to try and find a way in and say yeah. something, but I'm just gonna listen. Yeah. And it's and it's through being obedient to the Holy Spirit that the opportunity yeah. comes and then let God do what he's gonna yeah. do. You know yeah. what I'm saying? That's good. And to be fair, yeah, I don't I think you're also built different. So there might be some dudes out there that can't be friends with a gorgeous girl. Oh yeah, 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 hundred yeah. percent, hundred percent. So I think your back, yeah. your background, yeah, my background, hundred percent, and your yeah. your the yeah. seals and all that yeah. stuff, the ability to restrain and I and, think and be a big part of it too was 
I had been with every girl sure. under the sun before, sure. and you know what I mean. Yeah. So it was like, it was just like, oh, you know. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, to you, yeah. it's another pretty girl because you've been, you've, you've been, I've been yeah, and I work in Hollywood, so I see yeah. pretty women all the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, and I'm around a lot of people with money that got pretty women with right, them right, all right, the time. Right, you know right. what I mean? So yeah, it definitely is. You because there's gonna be some if, dude that listens weak, to this. Yeah, if you weak, like, right, I'm like, going yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a girl down the missionary dating. I'm a winner to Jesus. You will get caught up quick if you ain't strong enough. <laughs> All right, let's let's talk about this, and yeah. then we're gonna go to our Patreon exclusive. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk to you about. Yeah. Um, you said you did some work with some anti-human trafficking yeah, organizations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you you been keeping up with all this uh, hoopla around uh, the Sound of Freedom? Yeah, and some yeah. of the backlash about the Sound yeah. of Freedom. Um, Disney selling the yeah. Sound of Freedom to yeah. Angel Studios and it, it performing, I think, better than they yeah, expected it to. Yeah, hit 100 million. Yeah, and then the media is like pushing back and all yeah. this kind of, and some of that stuff, you know, the lead actor jumped out the window, said some yeah, kind of wild yeah, stuff yeah, about yeah. Q and all that yeah, kind of yeah. stuff. But uh, this is all, the movie was done in 2018, now it's yeah, coming yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. And so what do you make of, of one, the, the, the actual reality of how serious trafficking is? Yeah, it's, it's serious. And then two, yeah. Hollywood's seeming backlash, mainstream yeah. media seeming backlash to a movie that I think we should all acknowledge this yeah. is a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, no, it, one is a bad thing. I've not, I've volunteered with a bunch of different human trafficking nonprofits, all from different political spectrums, right? Like human trafficking nonprofits that are led and, and primarily by people on the left, mm -hmm. human trafficking nonprofits that are led primarily by people on the right, and everything in between, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And I could tell you from working with these different nonprofits and going overseas, you know what I mean, to a place where, uh, or places where Americans go to have with underage girls who are being trafficked by traffickers. Mm -hmm. I could tell you it's real. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. very real. It's evil. It's a $130 billion industry. Mm -hmm. And when people, here's another thing. When people hear human trafficking, they just think about trafficking. There's so many facets to human trafficking. Mm -hmm. You got organ harvesting, which is what my film focuses on. And that's what I try to focus on a little bit more because mm -hmm. there's so many people that focus on the trafficking mm -hmm. side of it. Mm -hmm. There's drug trafficking. I mm -hmm. interviewed a guy who was trafficked from, from what tra traffic slash tricked from, Venezuela to Colombia, Colombia to Mexico with the promise that he would be smuggled into the U.S. As soon as he got to, Me uh, to Mexico, he was essentially abducted by the people who told him, hey, come to this Mexican border town and we'll be able to sneak you in. You just got to pay us X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. And he was abducted, taken to a, 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 a house. In that house, there were women that were used for trafficking. The kids were used as mules trafficking mm -hmm. because they're small enough to fit through the tunnels to get through the tunnels to get you know from mexico into the u.s mm -hmm. and the men were used for other forms of trafficking as well mm -hmm. so there's different forms of, of of human trafficking and it's very prevalent and it's very widespread as a matter of fact so that 130 billion dollar yeah. number is worldwide worldwide all worldwide. trafficking all trafficking not gotcha. just trafficking got it okay. that's where people confuse they're like oh well, traffic but there's labor trafficking mm -hmm. there's people who are trafficked for labor all around the world mm -hmm. i mean in Africa, there's mines in Africa where kids are working in these mines and dying. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and they're they're essentially being used as, as labor slaves. Mm -hmm. There's marriage. There's forced marriage, which is a form of trafficking. Mm. Uh, there's obviously uh, there's uh, there's blood trafficking where people are being trafficked for their blood. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, there was a story that came out a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, about uh, at Harvard University. There was a guy who was working. Him and his girlfriend were working at the morgue at Harvard Harvard University, mm -hmm. and they were trafficking body parts. And fetuses. Darkness. True story. You can look that up. Yeah, it's a true, yeah. true story. So there's, so there's all these different forms of trafficking lead to that big number, mm -hmm. right? And here in the U.S., it's like a thirty billion dollar plus industry. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, Americans drive um, the demand for materials that are developed and created with traffic victims, mm. right? So it's, it's, it's very, very real. And mm -hmm. everybody, regardless of, well, I won't say everybody, but most people, regardless of what side they fall on right or left mm -hmm. will agree that it's real and mm -hmm. it's prominent and there's stories coming out every single day uh as it relates to people being discovered or there was a story that came out about a month or two ago of this american woman i believe who went to columbia to find love she mm -hmm. met this guy on some dating app he was a he was a med school student dude chopped her up took her organs part of her, her body parts washed up on the beach and he was selling her her, her organs on the black market on social media. Jeez. Right? Um, so so this this stuff does happen. Now, as far as what's going on in Hollywood, I think that one, 
it's anytime someone or something works mm -hmm. outside of the system, mm. I think people are threatened. Mm. Interesting. That's that's just that's just my experience. I think you know because you had this film that was it was it was it was financed and made like Disney didn't make the film. That's mm -hmm. another thing. Like I knew about that film because I I volunteered with O U R. Mm -hmm. I've went to South America with Tim Ballard and yeah. O U R like yeah, yeah. years ago. You okay. know what I mean? Okay. And so, so it's, and from all accounts, Tim Ballard seems like like the real deal. Yeah, 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 he does. Because they're he trying does, to like yeah, yeah, smear yeah, yeah, him yeah, 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 and saying like, oh, yeah. you know, these fake missions and this yeah. and that, you know. But yeah, from, yeah. from all measurable accounts, it seems like he's the real deal. Yeah, yeah. Well, him and his nonprofit does do good work. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, and I know because I've, I've, I went down to DR with them and we were in a slum where the parents sold their daughters to traffickers. Yeah. And darn. we were there yeah. to talk to the parents about, yo, here's what's going on, on with their do your daughters. Like, to this extent, you're screwing them up for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. Like, so I know that this stuff and what OUR has, you know, does do good work. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I just think that it wasn't expected for, you know, the film to be what it is. And then also, I think that the film was made around the time, you know, I'm, me, I'm an independent free market capitalist. So mm -hmm. I don't have any bone in the fight as it relates to Democrat or Republican. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there were so many people that were so opposed to, to Trump. Mm -hmm. Trump derangement syndrome, whatever the term is, that I think that anything that he advocated for, they got to jump on the opposite side of it. Yeah, or or which said, is so hey, which yeah. is so stupid. Yep. And then when when there were reports about QAnon and yeah. him doing signs yeah. and all that stuff, then that amplified it more. Mm -hmm. And I know that Tim Ballard uh, met with um, uh, Trump's human trafficking t task force, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 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 so I think that because of his affiliation with from a political standpoint, mm -hmm. I think that in Hollywood being primarily, you know, liberal, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Democrats for the most part. I think that that's another thing. It's like, Got you. people are still hanging on to, this is Trump's guy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Again, I have no bone in the fight. You know what I mean? I, I don't vote Democrat or Republican. Like mm -hmm. I'm an independent free market capitalist. You know, mm -hmm. I, I really feel like we need a, a third party that's as strong that's truly in the center you know what i mean but that's a whole nother conversation but i think that that's what that's what essentially that's what's going on yeah you know what yeah. i mean um, do, do, are they do, do you think they have the self-awareness of how goofy they come off arguing against a movie that's trying to stop human trafficking like or are they just so detached from the day-to-day -day person like yeah like outside of q outside of some of the wild yeah. things that jim caviezel said over there yeah. like Y'all are crazy yeah. pushing back against this movie. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, we all have to look at the spirit of the project. Mm -hmm. It's to bring awareness about a real project. Yeah. And I think that when people are trying to smear it for uh, political reasons or whatever, fill in the blank, mm -hmm. it just ends up backfiring on them. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? It yeah. just keeps it just it just blows up what their intention to true intentions are. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so um I mean, it's helped. All the negative press has helped. It definitely helped. Because yeah. a film is projected to do 150 million domestically. That's crazy. You know what I mean? On a 14.5 million dollar budget, it's already 80 plus million dollars. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so and again, it goes back to the point that I mentioned earlier. I think that you know uh the fact that this was not. This was essentially done outside of the system, because, mm -hmm. like I said, it was it was financed not by Angel Studio and not by Fox. Like mm -hmm. Tim and that team got independent finances together to mm -hmm. raise that fourteen point five million dollars, mm -hmm. and then they went to Fox and said, "Hey, you want to distribute this?" And Fox bought the distribution rights, mm -hmm. right? And so, but they just never distributed it. So you know, this was something that was started outside of the system. Mm -hmm. It sat, and then it got into the Hollywood system, mm -hmm. and then it didn't get released. But then somebody outside of the Hollywood system came along and said, "We'll distribute it," yep. and it blew up to be what it is now. Yep. And so those inside the system are saying, "Well, we're supposed to be the experts. We're supposed to be making these films that are making mm. all of this money. Why is this happening? This shouldn't be. Oh, it's happening because you know these because this group was these fanatics are watching. Or mm -hmm. it's happening because they bought they." Um, 
some people donated tickets, so mm -hmm. they have, they're trying to find every reason to sure. not justify its success. Why? Mm -hmm. Why do they have to do that, though? Mm -hmm. Because shareholders at the top mm -hmm. at Disney are going to be like, why? I don't care whether they're Christian or whether it's this or that. Yeah. I don't see color. I don't see I see green. Mm -hmm. Right at the end of the day, investors see green. That's mm -hmm. what they want. Yep. And so the reason why they got to come up with all of these things is because the investors and the shareholders are saying, "Why Disney did you give away this asset mm. that is now flipped? You know, triple fold. Yeah, more than triple fold. Yep. Yep. But then you have this other asset that came out around the same time. Yep. Indiana Jones, three hundred million dollar budget mm -hmm. that we're gonna lose. Yep. Two hundred plus million dollars yeah. on. Yeah. So in order to 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 keep their shareholders from bringing their necks, mm -hmm. it's like oh, it's because of this, it's because yeah. of that, yeah. it's because of that's and, and that's that that's my two gotcha. cents on it. Yeah. No, that's good. I think yeah. that's a good assessment. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think they're by trying to hurt it, they're helping. Yeah. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> um. Yeah. Tell them about your new book. Yeah, that is uh, when. What is the release date for this? Uh, new book releases this Tuesday, July twenty fifth. It's Chameleon. Um, it's something that's been in my head for over ten years. I know we didn't get a chance to touch on it too much, but part of my background, I was a human guy, so I went to various intelligence schools, and then I got to go overseas and put my my intelligence training to work. You mm -hmm. know, um, I had to be a chameleon. I had to be one person with one source, mm. and I had to be another person with another source, and I had to be another person with uh, admiral if I was, or general if I was brief, briefing them, and I had to I had to become a chameleon. And that's when the idea came to me, because I was like, here I am, this kid from the Bronx who can't, who got into this position, and I've never seen or learned or heard of a character like this. So that's mm. when it kind of started, the idea came to me. It started out, and then I wrote a screenplay years later. Uh, the first screenplay I wrote was Chameleon. Uh, and uh, and then that screenplay got read by some people in the publishing world, and they were mm -hmm. like, this can be, this is an awesome concept. You should consider doing this as a book series. Mm. Um, kind of like Tom Clancy and Dope. and Jason Bourne. And so I wrote it as a book series, and this is book one. It follows Kali, Khalif, Kali, Browder, Kent, mm -hmm. Um for those who know, have heard, uh, haven't heard the name Khalif Browder, Khalif Browder was a kid in the Bronx who was falsely accused of mm -hmm. stealing a backpack. Mm -hmm. He was uh, uh, sent to uh, Rikers Island jail for three years without trial. Yeah, super, um, super sad story. Yeah, man. yeah, tormented, abused, uh, in solitary confinement for 700 days. As a teen, he was a teenager, uh, went in when he was 16. His case finally got dismissed because they was uh, they the courts realized that this is a sham. Yep. Uh, he was finally released, committed suicide two years later. So I wanted to kind of pay homage and remind people mm. of Khalif Browder. So I named the main character Khalif Browder Kent, uh, AKA Kali Kent, mm -hmm. Khalif Browder, the real Khalif Browder grew up not too far from me in the Bronx. Oh, okay. And so there's that connection there. But then the story is just, it's, I tell people all the time, it's a fictional extension of transform yeah. because it's all the stuff that I really couldn't talk about in uh, transform, but sure. in a very fictional, fictional characters, fictional events, um, you know, fictional programs, all fictional to be able to tell a cool story mm -hmm. and in a grounded and authentic way. That's dope. And so that's uh, the chameleon. Yeah. Yeah. So, what we're going to do now, guys, is we're going to go over to our Patreon exclusive. I got a few more questions specifically yeah. about his life uh, story. The yeah. first one being changed into a movie, why he couldn't use some of the details from his real life in this fictional so story called Chameleon. And then I'm also curious about uh, your work with uh, the trafficking world, about this yeah. whole like is this a conspiracy? Is it not the whole adrenal yeah. blood stuff? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Um, so meet us over there on Patreon. This is one of the new pieces from the He Is Him collection, Jesus the King. When you wear this shirt, you do two things. One, you remind yourself in your life who the king is when you put this thing on. Two, you represent who the king is when you go out in public. So get ready for the He Is Him collection available this Friday to Sunday only. Hey, if you want to see the extended version of this podcast completely unedited, consider partnering with us in our online community for as little as $5 a month. In exchange, you get access to these podcasts as we stream them live before anyone else gets to see them. You get access to the replay of our daily after party streams, access to our private Discord server, access to discount codes, 
and so much more. So help us continue conceptualizing the gospel through media, podcasting, and YouTube, and partner with us for as little as $5 a month. Also, be sure to follow us on the Spotify podcast app, on Facebook, and on Instagram. We're constantly posting content there that I think you'll find extremely valuable. All right, I'll see you over there. Peace.